podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Network's on Sunday, January 19th, 2020. This is episode 1,662. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast comes to you from Twit's LastPass studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything's online. Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just $15 a month with their three-month introductory plan. Plus, you'll get it shipped to your door free at mintmobile.com slash techguy. And by LastPass. LastPass is a personal password manager and identity solution for businesses that helps secure everywhere you work and live. One password gets you in. And then LastPass takes care of the rest. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. And by Zapier. Zapier connects all your business software and handles the work for you so you can focus on what matters most. Right now through the end of the month, go to zapier.com slash tech guy for your free 14-day trial. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yes, it's time to talk tech. Computers, the internet, home theater. Smartphones, smart watches, you know, all the all the rigmarole, the peripherals, the the stuff of our modern lives. If you want to talk about tech, I'm here for you, baby. I'm not the I'm not just the tech I am your tech guy. Eighty eight eighty eight ask Leo is the uh, phone number. Eight 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 two seven five five three six. That's toll free from anywhere in the US or in Canada. And you can call that number and we will talk. I will help whether you have a computer problem or a suggestion or a question or you just want to understand. Maybe a little as we used to say, hand holding on the information super highway. They don't call it that anymore, do they? <laughs> the internet it's funny how the internet has just it's woven into our the fabric of our lives, isn't it? And it's uh, it's its influence is completely pervasive. It's just in everything we do, and it's so funny how quickly humans are amazingly adaptable. We just take it take for granted the fact that we have information at our fingertips at all times. It used to be, it would drive me crazy. You know, I you'd have a fact on the just right on the tip of your tongue, and you just can't quite. Like the name of the movie with with uh, Julia Roberts and uh, Richard Gere, and it was a big hit. What was the name of that? And you can't, but you know all you have to do nowadays, you pull out your phone, you can ask, you know who, and depending on whose phone you have, and you know who will say, oh yeah, that was a pretty woman, and it'll tell you more if you want. This used to happen to me all the time, or you or you'd say, yeah, I wonder, wonder what the uh, production of uh, steel in metric tons was in the year 1992. What was the U.S. production of steel in metric tons in 1992? And if you wanted to know that in, the, in, a, in back in my day, not even that long ago, 20 years ago, you'd have to go to the library. <laughs> the library and, and look it up. And it would probably not, you know, it would take some actual skills to find it, wouldn't it? You might have to go to the the reference librarian and ask for her, her help and say, how, how do you know? <laughs> Nowadays, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want to know, it's there. And a lot of stuff you don't want to know, it's, it's right there. What a change. There's another change. There are other changes. Of course, there are a lot of changes that the, the Internet hath wrought and, and computers in general hath wrought. Uh, you, you know, local newspapers kind of dying. Um, local radio stations kind of falling off the wayside. It's just, we get everything uh, via the internet now. We're so dependent on it. So dependent on it. Um, I read a really interesting piece in the Atlantic yesterday. Used to be a magazine. They they would print these on, on dead trees and they'd mail them to you. 
The Atlantic is one of the few magazines that's really survived the digital era by, by getting very aggressive in the digital f domain. I don't know if they make money. The New York Times announced, this was interesting, the New York Times announced that this year they, uh, they made almost a billion dollars in subscriptions, digital subscriptions. That's really encouraging. It means people are willing to pay for something, some sort of content. I hope the Atlantic's doing well. Article by a guy named Robert, Robinson Meyer that I just, uh, it kind of resonated with me. What the death of iTunes says about our digital habits. We, have, we are a nation of digital hoarders, and it really started with Gmail 20, almost 20 years ago when Gmail first came out. The whole point of Gmail was you never delete your mail ever again. Just keep it all, and Google, the kings of search, will let you search for it. Boom, there it is. Everything you've ever talked about, written about, you forgot somebody's address, no problem, search their name, it's there. Years and years and years worth. And don't worry, they even said, don't worry. You'll, unlimited storage, it wasn't. But, you know, virtually unlimited storage. So there's no reason to throw anything out. That's what's changed. There's no reason to throw anything out. Hard drive space is cheap. Look at your phone. And this is, this is one of the things Robinson was talking about. He's, look at your phone. Uh, in the in the in the old days, when the iPhone first came out, most iPhone users only maybe one or two home screens, maybe even you put your apps in folders. But with the death of iTunes, you used to be able to drag the apps around. Remember that? But it was kind of a pain when you get a new phone; you have to drag it all around again. <laughs> Nowadays, nobody does that. Well, you tell me. You tell me. Most iPhone users, he says, could not tell you where the most used apps on their phone live. Because it doesn't matter anymore. Don't put your apps in folders. Don't organize them. Download them and search for them because that's, that's, that's the reality of the, of the 2000s. You just, you know, you pull down the screen a little bit. You type the first few letters. There's your app. Who knows where it is? It's in there somewhere. The, since 2010, the cost of a gigabyte of hard drive space has gone gone from 10 cents to one cent in 10 years. I just bought a 16 terabyte hard drive for under $400. 16 terabytes is an unimaginable. The entire Library of Congress fits an eight. Two libraries of Congress could fit on that one hard drive. And it's $400 of storage. So we now live in this, in this world where <laughs> you, just, you just keep it all, right? Is that right? Remember, remember uh, this seems so naive, so innocent. The days of the inbox zero. Did you ever hear that phrase, inbox zero? The idea, and I think there's still some people pursuing it, give it up. It's over. The idea was every day, I shall go into my email inbox and I shall process everything is in there until there are zero emails in my inbox. Do you do that? The only people still doing that are nuts. You want to know how many emails are in my inbox? Let's go check. I don't even look anymore. <laughs> I think it's well over 25,000. Inbox zero? Are you kidding me? In fact, there, people even made up this idea of, call, of declaring email bankruptcy. Where you would say to people, um, I give up. I have too many emails. I can't get to you all. I am now at this point, as of today, January 19th, 2020, deleting all my email. If, you, if I haven't responded to you, send it again. I'm going to start over. I'm declaring email bankruptcy. Have you heard it? <laughs> this was about the same time as Inbox Zero. No. Nobody does that anymore. You just, it's, I get but there's a side effect, right? Because uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't even look at my email anymore. I mean, once in a while. It's always, it's an adventure. I always feel, I got, geez, I got, I, the other, I felt so bad. Old friend, really good friend, long time ago, Paul, I'm so sorry, uh, sent me an email in, I think it was May of last year, saying, hey, I need a little uh Help, could, could you just call me and, and give me a little help on the computer thing because I have a little question. And he probably thinks I don't like him because I never answered because I never saw it. 
And now what do you do? It's May. This been, it's now it's eight months later. Now what do I do? Do I answer it? What would you do? Would you answer it and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see this. That's kind of sad. That's pathetic. Would you just ignore, continue to ignore it and then let him have the misapprehension that I hate him? Because I don't. I love him. But I, I don't know what to do. All right. I'm sorry. Retro G is correcting me. There's so much hoarding going on at the Library of Congress. It has gone from 8 terabytes to 20 terabytes. So I need to buy two drives. And then I'd still have a little left over. The whole li the Library of Congress contains every published work ever in the United States that's ever been published in the United States, and it's 20 terabytes. It's crazy. They're hoarding. <laughs> They're like all of us. They're like all of us. Uh, Robinson Meyer at the Atlantic finishes his piece. By saying, in 1940, the German critic Walter Benjamin wrote about an angel in a Paul Clay painting. The angel, quote, looked as though he's about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed, but a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. Robinson writes, it's now clear 80 years later the angel is looking at his iPhone. 8888, ask Leo. Let's, I'm just, you know, I bring this up only to say it's okay. Don't feel guilty. You haven't answered that email since May. Your iPhone is completely disorganized. I bet you, you might even be the kind of person who has like a thousand icons right there on the desktop of their computer. Just like, <laughs> I see that and I go, what the? There's some of us that are a little OCD, like we're, we're, we're still organized. Give it up. Forget it. It can't happen. How? It's impossible. How many files are on your computer? I don't think Siri knows the answer to that one, but just look. How many files? It, there are, in all likelihood, many tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds, hundreds of thousands of files on your computer right now. Most of which you have no idea what they do. Just leave them. It's fine. I have to, I have to counsel people. People call and say, you know, I want to use registry cleaner because I just know my registry is a mess. Don't do that. Just leave it. <laughs> you do that at your own peril. That's all I'm saying. 8888-ASK-LEO. Your phone calls coming up next. And here she is, ladies and gentlemen. Kimmy, don't take no chaffer. Our phone angel. Hello, Kimmy. Good morning. Both of us wearing our 49ers gear because I understand there is a, some sort of sporting event. There is a, a sports ball game and you are decked out in gold and I am decked out in red. You told me and you were right. You said set a reminder set on alarm. your phone. Yep. And as soon as I left the house, it said, bring my Niners jacket. <laughs> there you go. So you told me, you warned me yeah. and it worked. I did bring my Niners jacket and my Niners hard hat. <laughs> hard hat. I don't know why I have this. If I ever did, have to do any construction, I'm Did set. you get gifted that for your uh, hat wall? I bought it, man. You bought that? Okay. But, you know, the funny thing is I wore this to uh, Levi Stadium, the Niners Stadium, and they wouldn't let me wear it in. You can't take anything beyond it's, the size of my hand I know. in there. And, yeah, I don't and know your purse has to be clear. Oh, it is. Or, the NFL's but, gotten very... Yeah. Uh, I and had to go buy a special conscious. purse to. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah, just special. a wallet on a chain. Just yeah. To and go guess, in there. guess where you buy that purse? Well, I didn't buy it there. I stopped at oh, the Marshalls okay. on the way. <laughs> you were smart. The NFL store sells them. Yeah. No. Lisa always has a hard time, though, with getting into the stadium. And she says, This is an NFL store purse. You have to let me in. <laughs> I and bought they, it. And they still tell her and no. They still, well, and I had to put my helmet back on the bus. Well, at least you were on a bus. Well, there would have been a vehicle of some sort I could yeah, put. Yeah, you could have done what I did and take took to take the train. Take the train. We've done yeah. that. Yeah, Where, and you don't want to put it on the train. You'll yeah, never you see can't it put again. It on the train. <laughs> I think they have lockers or something. It'll you can end up in Milwaukee. Stuff. So, <laughs> um, so we're going to be paying close attention, despite the fact that there will be certain hand egg activities going on during the day. Well, our game doesn't start until well, you're you're going to be on the air with another show. I do a different show. Yeah. I yeah. will not be very well focused on that show. Plus, it may end very quickly. Normally, it's a two-hour show. Maybe <laughs> a half hour. One hour and out. Yeah. 
Maybe over quickly. Well, at least everybody, it looks like, is via Skype. So you didn't make anybody drive all the way up here yeah. for that half hour show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, when we couldn't get anyone to do that. Nobody wanted to do it. Are you kidding me? So, but you know what? One thing geeks don't care about is football. And so let's take some calls. How let's... about Frank and Huntington Beach? And I think this should be a softball for you. So I'm going to start you oh, out easy on this. A good sport Sunday. analogy. Yeah. Well yeah. done, yeah. Kim yeah. Schaffer. <laughs> Frank and Huntington Beach. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, hi Frank. Are you hi, Leo. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hello, Frank. Hey. How you doing? Uh, hey, listen, I got an uh, iPad mini. I got an iPad mini, and I want to hook it up to my computer monitor. Can yeah. Can I do that? Oh, yeah. The uh, mini, uh, especially the new ones, uh, well, all of them, but the mini, the new one's easy because it's got HDMI. All of the minis have video out of some kind. That's what's changed in the computer world is is the interface. You know, it used to be a VGA analog output that was really common, and then we went to display port, mini display port, and then they went, but HDMI is now the standard, and the Mac mini has a full-size HDMI port in the back, unless you have a very old monitor. You should just get a regular HDMI cable. It'll work. If you have an older monitor, you may have to get an adapter. But in, in every case, you can make it work. Yeah, no, I got the uh, it, the uh, monitor that I got. It does have an HDMI hook. Yeah, so yeah. It'll be easy. Just plug it in. Can I use a mouse with my um, yeah. iPad? So the whole... I oh, wait a minute. iPad or Mac Mini? You said iPad Mini. Uh, iPad, iPad Mini. IPad. Oh. <laughs> Rewind. I thought you were talking about a Mac Mini. An iPad Mini no. does not have an HDMI port. It only has a lightning port, and you cannot hook it up to a mouse or a monitor. But here's good news. It'll work with a keyboard, but only a Bluetooth keyboard. Oh, okay. Yeah. Somehow to my, so, uh, yeah, you could AirPlay monitor. it to a monitor. That might be the easier thing to do. Uh, if you had an Apple TV or something like that, you can AirPlay it. Um, some TVs okay. would work. Uh, how could he get it to a standard monitor? That's an interesting question. Um, the newer Macs, uh, I'm sorry, the newer iPads, the iPad Pros have a Type-C connector that will drive a monitor. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I take it back. Scooter X is reminding me that Apple sells, what am I? I'm an idiot. Apple sells an adapter that's lightning to HDMI. I even have a few of them. So, yes, you can cool, cool. absolutely do it. In fact, not only that, but John, my studio manager, just brought me a handful of them. So, yes, obviously you can do that. What am I thinking? Actually, these are... Good these deal, are, Leo. Yeah, well, I'm so sorry. So one of the things you're going to want to do, and notice um, that both... this One is an official Apple one, and one is a third party. I would always get an MFI made for iPhone or Apple certified. Get it from Apple. They're a little more expensive. But notice one of the things on this is it has... A lightning connector and an HDMI, full-size HDMI. Now you can connect to your monitor. But it also has another charging port on it. And you will want to do that because, of course, you're occupying the only port on the iPad when you put this connector okay. in. And if you, and if you, unless, I mean, you can run it on the battery, but it'll dry, die down. Do you want to watch movies and that kind of thing? Is that it? Uh, no, I just want a bigger screen. So you I want a computer. Look at okay. a bigger screen. Yeah. You can use a mouse. It's a little weird. It's in their accessibility options on iOS 13. Um, so you, I shouldn't say you can't, it's just, it's not really made for a mouse. It's made for touch, but you could use a mouse and you can certainly use a Bluetooth keyboard. So if you have a Bluetooth keyboard, a Bluetooth mouse, and, uh, you get this HDMI adapter. Now it's, now it's like a little computer, a little mini computer. I'm sorry about the confusion. I heard the word mini. I thought Mac mini. It's probably cause I'm wearing this 49ers helmet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, Sam coming up. Uh, Sam Abu Samet. Hey, Leo. How are you, Sammy? I'm doing all right. How about you? I am good. He's wearing his Alfa Romeo hat. What's the best Italian car? Uh, well, it depends on how you define best. If I had unlimited funds, a Lambo, a Ferrari, or an Alfa? Um... Uh, you know, alphas are a lot fiat. closer to being affordable. Yeah. Um, you know, they you know they're in the fifty to eighty thousand dollar range. 
uh, actually starting probably about 40,000. Um, oh, I left out Ferraris, Maserati. That's a nice one. Yeah. Too. For, for Ferraris and Lamborghinis are at the high end, yeah. you know, and there it's, you know, it's more a matter of kind of taste and style, you know, what, you know, whichever one you prefer. I mean, they're yeah. both really good. Um, uh, you know, tech from a technical My friend has a Maserati. He likes his Maserati. Yeah, Maseratis are great too, and yeah, you know, they kind of fall in between there in that like hundred and twenty, hundred to hundred and twenty thousand dollar range usually. I saw, uh, I finally saw Ford versus Ferrari. Yeah, what'd you think? A great movie. And I still I, haven't gotten around to seeing. Oh, it. you're gonna. I'm not I, even a car guy, but I, I really I've read dug the, it. I've I've read the book that right. it was you know derived from, yeah. uh, Go Like Hell, which is a really great book, nice. and they they changed some stuff. They they originally optioned it and. AJ Bame, who wrote the book, was going to originally write the script, and they they didn't go for his script, and so uh, they brought in another screenwriter, and they changed a bunch of stuff. So there's some stuff in there that didn't actually happen, but the general gist of the story of how Ford went after Ferrari at Le Mans after uh, uh, they tried to buy Ferrari and Enzo uh, turned them, them away. <laughs> Yeah, said, Did, okay, is fine. it a true we'll story that Enzo used it to uh, in increase his sale price to Fiat and end up selling to yeah. Fiat? That's what happened. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That really got H HF2 ex really upset. Yep. Hank the Deuce was not pleased about Hank that. Hank the and... Deuce was peeved. Mighty, oh, yeah. Mightily miffed. And so he gave, gave basically gave the team a blank check to go build a build a car to beat yeah. Ferrari on the track. Then the other side of it, and I wonder if this is true, is... Uh, Lee Iacocca's in it. He's great. He's the guy who convinces Hank the Deuce that uh, this is something to do. But there's also a guy named Leo Beebe who ends up being the villain in the in the matter. And I'm betting that they made that up a little bit because they needed a, a you know a good antagonist. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't wasn't quite that way. Um, you know, Beebe, they, Beebe says, they're... "I'm running this, and you can't use Ken. I'm going to make you use my driver." And then he's the guy who says. Hey, it would be really cool if all three Fords came in across the finish line at the same time and we can get a photo of it. That would be good for marketing. Now, I won't tell you what happened because no spoilers. You know what happened. Yeah. No spoilers. Well, that, that, that didn't actually happen until their third year of running at Le Mans. Oh, they, really? The first they, time? They're, the, they, they, the GT40s debuted at Le Mans in 1964 Yeah. and did not finish. And same oh, wow. thing in 65. Oh, yeah. See, they left all and, that out. Yeah, it wasn't until 1966 that they finally yes. uh, had that. There that was finish. a little... And even that was very controversial. Oh, really? Yeah, um, because um, Ken Miles had... and uh, I'm trying to, uh, Ken was driving with Bruce McLaren. If McLaren I won correctly. because... Uh, oh, no, yeah, that's right. Let's not talk about that whole yeah. thing because that's, that's kind of... Uh, I don't yeah. want to spoil but it. But at any rate... Ken Ken Miles should have won that race. Yes, and he basically got screwed out of it by in this in this movie Leo Beebe. But I'll uh, no, actually it was the um, the Le Mans race officials. Uh, well, yes, no, the, the, they follow the rule anyway. Yeah, do watch it. I think you will love it. Uh, I I will. It's part. And it was nominated one, for a best picture, and that's so Lisa yeah. and I watch all the best picture nominees every year. Yeah. The the other one you might want to check out is a documentary that uh, Twig the other day Ant was talking about it called. Uh, yeah, Adam uh, Carolla. Shelby I can't Netflix. believe Adam yeah. Carolla did uh, did that. He produced it. it. Means he put up the money. That magic music tells us it's time for my good buddy Sam Abel Samad. He is a principal researcher at Navigant Research, a car guy. Through and through, he's got antifreeze in his veins. His <laughs> podcast, Wheel Bearings, is at wheelbearings.media, and he joins us every week. You've made me a car guy. I've never been a car guy. We were just talking about the movie Ford versus Ferrari, which is uh, Oscar-nominated for Best Picture. Really fun, great movie. Christian Bale is so good as Ken Miles. Uh, Matt I, Damon. I, I once met uh, Ken Miles' brother, John. Yeah. Because uh, Ken, Ken died Tragically in 1966. Tragically died. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I met his brother John uh, back early in my engineering career. Uh, he was he was an engineer at Lotus, and uh, I was working on a project uh, for Lotus. We were working on ABS for uh, Lotus Esprit race cars in Neat. 1990 91. Neat. And uh, I was fortunate enough to meet him. That's your connection to Tesla because they use those Lotus Esprits as the yep. Roadster's body in the first Tesla. Anyway, Sam comes here to talk uh, cars. We talk a lot about the technology in modern vehicles, including 
I'm thinking that's a cell. What is that in there? That uh, that is a. What is that? You've got. I'm, I always like to see what the pictures. He's got a Cadillac. I recognize the Cadillac over your right shoulder. Is that the CTS? Yeah, the CT6. CT6. Uh, the same. The one we drove a couple of years ago Love with car. Super Cruise. Yeah, and then over and, your over your right shoulder, you or your left shoulder, you've got something else. What is that? Yeah. So this is a new device that's coming out in a few weeks. It's called uh, the Car and Driver Copilot. I thought it was a radar detector. Kind of looks like it. Uh, no, it's it's uh, it's made by a company uh, called Fesco Group. Uh, they they partner uh, with they they own a bunch of different brands, but uh, one of the things they do is they they make products that are branded by Car and Driver. So they have a, hmm. a licensing agreement with Car and Driver magazine, and they sell a bunch of different dash cams and various other devices. And this is a new device that they've got coming out. And the reason I've got it here along with the uh, the interior of the CT6 with Super Cruise is this is using some of the same technology that was in that that Cadillac and that, that's also in all the rest of the uh, Cadillacs that are coming out this year uh, that are finally getting Super Cruise, uh, which is a driver monitor system. Yeah, uh, so when I, with the Cadillac, when I was driving it, on my Tesla, to tell it when you're in the, uh, you know, adaptive cruise control and the lane keeping, they call it autopilot. I don't. Uh, you have to, every once in a while, slightly torque the wheel. It's got a little torque monitor in the wheel to tell it you're still alive, still paying attention, mm -hmm. which is a pain because if you don't do it just right, then it p turns it off and annoys you. Cadillac, it was harder to do that because it wasn't watching my hands on the wheel. It was watching my eyes. Yeah. So uh, what what they did on the uh, on the Cadillac, uh, they used a system from a, an Australian company called Seeing Machines. Uh, so they're in the steering wheel rim. There are some IR emitters, and then there's an infrared camera sitting on top of the steering column. And it's basically the same principle as the Face ID system on an iPhone. Uh, so it's the emitters are flooding your face with uh, um, with infrared uh, light. And then the camera is picking that up, and it's it's doing gaze detection. So it's, what it's doing on Super Cruise, it's making sure that you're actually still watching the road. Because even though it's designed as a hands-off system, you're still supposed to be ready to take over. And so they, they should, want to make sure call that it you're gaze alert. Star. Yeah, yeah, they could they could do that. Yeah. Uh, so but, and it was it so, was so hard because I'm trying to t it trigger it because on the CT6 it rattles the seat and it really lets you know, and. I just could not look away from the road. Like I had to peek between my fingers to trick it because I just was so scared to look away while I'm driving 65 miles an hour down the freeway. But it yeah, worked. It, 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 it did work, and it works very well. And so what uh, this new device is, this, co this car and driver co-pilot, um, same concept. Uh, you've got a little device. You stick it on your windshield uh, up by the, by, the, by the sun visor, by the mirror, and there's a camera, an IR camera on there and six infrared emitters, and it watches your face to wow. check. You know, it, so and, why and would I want that in my car? Well, what it's what it's designed for is it's got some uh, machine learning algorithms in there, and so uh, the reason they use IR is so they can still see your eyes like through dark sunglasses or polarized sunglasses, and so it's looking for certain patterns that would be indicative of you getting tired or ill um, or losing consciousness for that matter, and. Uh, what it you know what it does you know if you're driving down the road and you've got this thing sitting in front of you and you're watching it, if you've been on a long road trip and you're you're starting to get drowsy you know your head might be nodding off it will give you you know it'll give you audible alerts when wow. uh, when it detects that you might be getting too tired to drive safely and so that's your cue to say okay I'm gonna pull over and you know, pull into this next rest area or pull off the road here and and you know take a rest you know or get a cup of coffee or something that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so you so <laughs> I, I look at something like that and think, oh, court mandated. But uh, <laughs> no, no, you, this, you might this just will be do available it for, safety. for anybody to purchase. Yeah. 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 You know, if especially you know if you're somebody that does a lot of driving, a lot of long road trips, yeah. you know, this can be very valuable. Or you know, just depend. You know, depending on what your schedule is. You know, if you maybe if you work night shifts, you know, you could be tired when you're coming home Every, from work. When I worked uh, uh, on tech TV, I have to commute. All the way from San Francisco up here to Petaluma, it's about an hour, hour and a half, two hours if there's bad traffic. And I would get sleepy every night. You know, it's about 8 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock. And I would just get sleepy every every time. 
So, yeah, this is exactly the kind of device you be, need. Yeah, because that's that's a major cause of accidents. It's just people getting tired, you know, and running off the road, or you know, just not not paying enough attention, you know, just because they're drowsy it's or dangerous. or if they get sick. Yeah. yeah, it's very dangerous. So it's, does it sound a shrill alarm? I mean, I love the CT6. It shook my seat like I was like trying to wake me up almost. Yeah, I mean, you know, because this is an aftermarket system, really it's obviously that. not tied into systems in the car. So, yeah, it's got an alarm built into it, and it gets progressively louder ah. if you don't wake respond. Up. Wake up, Leo. Wake up, Leo. Yeah. Ah! Oh, sorry. <laughs> and and you'll be able to adjust it, you know, to, uh, for how sensitive it is or how loud it is. But, uh, you know, it's, it's something that could potentially be a really great device. And... In the next few years, we're going to start seeing more of these types of systems built into new vehicles. Um, you know, in Europe, uh, starting from 2022, uh, for the what's known as the Euro NCAP test, the New Car Assessment Program, which is their their crash safety program, uh, they're going to start. One of the things they're going to start scoring cars on is having driver or um, driver monitor systems. So you won't, you know, manufacturers won't be able to get a full five star rating oh, if they don't have an yeah. active driver monitor system in there. You might even uh, get so an insurance break if you had uh, if you put something like this in. Insurance companies, I would um, jump on yeah, I don't, I don't point. think, I don't know if any insurance companies are uh, have yet. actually said they will do that yet. But that is something that they could potentially do going forward. Yeah, yeah, boy, that'd be. That'd and be cool. and you know, in addition to the camera in there, there's also there's a GPS receiver in there to detect when the car is actually moving. Ah. Um, so. So if you, you take know, a so, nap in your car, you know, it's not going to wake you yeah, up. If you pull over driving. and actually take a nap, That's it's fair. not going to wake you up. But if you're <laughs> if you're fair. on the move, then it will it'll it'll alert you. What do you do if you get sleepy at the wheel? Do you pull over and take a nap? Yeah, you know, I'll try to you know pull off either in a rest area or go off to a coffee shop or something, you know, and you know either just you know lay back and depending what the situation is, maybe take a nap for twenty minutes or or go get a cup of coffee and just walk around, you know, maybe uh, get a snack. And that, is it that a little helped. weird? I would slap myself. <laughs> I seriously, I, I have I've tried that. I don't think that's actually very effective. I haven't found it to be very effective. It makes me angry at myself. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? Well, take this. Why I wanna? Oh, but it certainly um, <laughs> it wakes you up briefly anyway. <laughs> Sam Abul Samid. He is a great podcast. Wheel bearings. You got to listen to it. Wheelbearings.media joins us every week to talk automotive technology. You'll find him uh, at Navigant Research and here every week. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Leo. Slap me one more time. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Best stay awake method, according to Phoenix Warp 1 in our chat room, is roll down your window and hold a $100 bill outside while you're <laughs> driving. <laughs> That is probably effective. That's an interesting approach. Anything that, you know, gets the heart started. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I mean, just rolling down the window, you that know, turning down the, the climate control. Yeah. That that helps. I was um, just you know. terrified. I'm, I was so, I, I did that commute for 13 years. And I was so grateful. It was the only thing that ma that took the sting out of, uh, out of losing uh, the screensavers and tech TV was, I, I just thought someday I am going to drive off the road or, or worse, drive into the other lane or something and just have a horrific ac accident. So no, I, I hear you. I've, I've, you know, I've, I've had jobs where I've had long commutes and uh, uh, nothing quite that bad. But uh, well, I've ne you know, but you would kind of, you would kind of go, oh, you would start up because yep. you you know, and it's not that's yep, scary. That's not good. Yeah. yeah. No, it's not good at all. So I turn up the music. Know, having, or... having something like this that can you know really keep an eye on you. Uh, it's is, a good idea. is a good thing. Yeah, it's a very. And it's going to be about three hundred bucks wow. uh, when they launch it. I would get it for I'm sure. Oh, we should have mentioned that. When is it out? Uh, it should be out uh, by the end of February. Did you see that at CES? Or probably middle of February. Uh, it was at CES. I didn't have a chance to actually meet up with the company, but I got a briefing. Uh, we had a phone call uh, earlier this week, and uh, they told me all about told me all about it and gave me the details. That's the frustration of CES, unfortunately. Yeah, it's is, just too many people. Yeah, and then you get home and there's CES regret because you went, oh, that would have been perfect. Like that would have been perfect to do. Right. Um, and they were they were down in the South Hall somewhere, I think. Somewhere. Yeah. Uh, somewhere. I went through all the halls, I thought. But, the, man, the South Hall is so big. Yeah. So big. Some jurisdictions regulate or prohibit use of these devices. What? Why would they prohibit the use of a wake-up device? 
Our show today brought to you by the Fox. I've got the Fox box right here. Mint Mobile. This thing, unbelievable. You're, I guarantee you, you're paying too much for cell service. You know it. You know you are, unless you're with Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage from T-Mobile at a fraction of the cost because they eliminate the retail stores, the advertising, the inflated prices, the hidden fees. Mint Mobile can give you wireless service. In fact, cut it, your cost, your entire cost down to $15 a month. This is with their three-month introductory plan. You get unlimited nationwide talk, unlimited nationwide text. You stop paying for data you don't use. $15 a month. I actually opted. I liked it so much. I tried the introductory plan, and I said, no, forget it. I'm going all the way. I paid, and I paid ahead for a year. That gave me the best discount. So I paid uh, $300 for a year, 12 gigabytes a month, unlimited talk and text. That's $25 a month. You're trying to get $25 a month from any other cell carrier. Mint Mobile, they are awesome. That's why I wear Fox socks and the Fox hat and the Fox mug. I do it all. You're going to get this Mint Mobile SIM, put it in your existing phone. They also sell phones, but you can bring your own phone. That'll save you even more money. Choose between three, eight. 12 gigabytes, 4G LTE data from T-Mobile, and uh, save. I mean, what, what more do you need to know? Get your new wireless plan, just $15 a month with their three-month introductory plan, and get it shipped right to you for free. You get the SIM, you get the whole thing. Somebody took my SIM. I put Mint Mobile in everything because it saves me so much money. MintMobile.com slash tech guy. Cut your wireless bill to $15 a month with a three-month introductory plan. MintMobile.com. Slash Tech Guy. Oh, and we thank him for supporting the Tech Guy podcast. And I thank you for supporting the Tech Guy podcast by going to mintmobile.com slash tech guy. Okay? Okay. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number. Ed in San Diego. Hello, Ed. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm pretty good. Got a little computer problem. Oh, sure. Why not? <laughs> I, more computer, more problems, problems right? <laughs> yeah, you know it. They're, they're so advanced now, I can hardly keep up. Oh, I know. And Maybe they're so complex. Good. And the pro part of the problem with computing these days, they have gotten more reliable, but they're still much more complex than ever. So when it goes wrong, it goes wrong. It's hard to, it's like well, a car. You can't it. would have helped it. if my son told me his virus scan was expired. Yeah. You, you have a teenager I, using your computer? He has his own computer. And this is that's the one that's the old. problem? Yep. Yep. Anytime you have a teenager on a computer, uh, almost certainly you're going to at some point get some malware on that, whether or not you're running an antivirus. An antivirus is not going to protect you from malware. Only, oh, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. So what happens? Oh, uh, So wait, he got a blue screen error. Okay. That Windows didn't boot properly. Yep. And his brother tried a few things, and then he says, I can't get this to work. And so I went in and took a look at it, and I said, well, it needs to go into safe mode. And so that's what I tried to do. I tried to put it in safe mode. And I went to the BIOS, and, well, I tried to get it in safe mode first because I know you hold the, you just turn it off three times, and it's supposed to go into safe mode. But it wouldn't go into safe mode. I thought, this is weird. So I thought, well, maybe it's the BIOS. So I went to the BIOS and looked at the BIOS, and it looked like it's set up correctly. And then I went back to try it again and it still didn't work and I thought well maybe I should boot from the Windows disk and see if it'll boot that way yeah and it would boot from there yeah but it won't let me change anything uh, won't let me reload Windows or oh anything. what does it say when you try to do that it says that I can't load it to that disk okay so it's not a virus it's the most single most common problem on on computers it's a disk failure and it, there are all kinds of disk failures. It doesn't have to be a complete failure. It can be spinning. There can be data on it. Everything could be fine. If just one little tiny bit on a critical sector, say the master boot record or the system 32 DLL or something like that, one little bit is flipped or, or one little sector can't be read, the whole thing won't boot. And that's almost oh. certainly what's happened to you. And <clears throat> that's good news in some ways, bad news in other ways. You can sometimes try to recover these disks. I know people 
you know, are trying to do that. But boy, it's so cheap to replace the disc. Unless yeah, your son you know, has something on there that he absolutely has to have. Nothing. Yeah. Just games. Yeah. You can reinstall those. Yeah. So you could, I mean, you could, I'll tell you why I think it's more serious than just, you know, a flipped bit. Windows installer, if it could write to those critical sectors, would just install. The fact that it says I can't install to this disk tells me it, it's saying, well, for I don't know, but something like uh, the master boot record is corrupted. I can't write to it or right. I can't write to that. So it's telling you that the disk, whether it's completely dead or just partially dead, is not usable. And at that point, well, you really have no choice but to replace it. How big is that drive? I bet it's not too big. It's a... Uh one gig. Yeah. I bet your son would like something a little larger. I don't even think you could buy a one gig drive anymore. <laughs> I, think, so, I think it's a gig. I'm not even sure. Yeah, go you know what? Go to go to the go online, buy you're gonna to want to replace exactly that disc. Ideally, if you really like your son, you'd get him in a solid state drive, not a spinning disc. Uh huh. So much faster and easily as reliable. Um, I think a solid state drive would be a great replacement, and I'm talking thirty or forty dollars for a much larger disc. Just oh, my go, wife is correct. I mean, yeah, like it's a, it it's might be like eight gig, eight gigs. Yeah, you can get yeah. you can get a terabyte for thirty or forty bucks. It's it's a tiny disc. So so I would go online, look for a, my favorite is the Samsung EVO SSDs. But you, you're going to want to make sure you get the same kind of drive. It sounds like a pretty old machine, so you might that may not work because you may need a SATA drive, and which. But you can get a replacement drive easily in there. You'll install Windows on top of it, and you'll be good. Yeah, I was wondering why I couldn't. It wouldn't let me. Wouldn't let me load to the the drive. Yeah, that's that's you the can't, that's you the can't put Windows on this drive. Yeah, that's, that's the like, diagnostic. That's, that's the that's the killer diagnostic. That means Windows is looking at the disk and says, the places I need to write to, I can't. Whether that means the disk itself is dead entirely or just partially damaged, doesn't matter. It's, so not, it's not the UEFI or anything? No, I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, Because when I tried to go to the diagnosis and then advanced, and then when I looked at the start window, it's not there. You're overthinking it. UEFI. You're, you're overthinking it. Those, those uh, The first thing that goes in is... What's the moving part in a computer these days? The one and only. It's the only one thing. Yeah. yeah. What what dies first in any device? The moving parts. Sure. The the single most common reason for computer slowdowns, computer failures, unreliability, blue screens of death is just a bad hard drive. Those are the things that die first. So okay. honestly, you could easily replace that drive. You're not going to be able to get an eight gigabyte drive, but you can easily replace that drive. And depending on how much you like your son, you can spend. You know, it will be less than a hundred bucks, no matter what. Okay. All right. Thanks, Leo. My pleasure. It. Yeah, it's the thing that almost always goes first. Is this? Is this? The fans, the power supply, or the hard drive? Those are the three. You know, moving parts, vulnerable pieces. Power supplies die often as well. But when you get a blue screen and then you try to run a Windows installer and it says, I can't, could be other stuff. Could be other stuff. You're going to want to, though, tr you know, do a little, di open up the computer. I, I didn't get whether it was a laptop or a desktop, but if it's a desktop, this is easy. Open it up and take that old drive out and get something that matches it exactly, same connector and everything. Hard drives are cheap these days. Stephen, uh, no, no, Stephen's coming up. It's uh, Alice in West Virginia. Hi, Alice. Leo Laporte. Oh, hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for calling. <laughs> um, I have an iPhone 7, and um, it's been the strangest thing. Um, when you're talking on the telephone, you'll have one bar, then it hops to three or four bars, <laughs> then back to one bar. Yeah. The little battery, sometimes like the little, you know, icon yeah. is white black white black or i'm talking to someone they can hear me then they can't hear me or if i get up and i move from one spot to another um you know they can't hear me i have to go back i think I you're you think are you in a rural part of uh, west virginia oh um oh and this happens in san diego oh you know in I the mean, big city huh that I'm in West Virginia because I thought it may have been something in my house because they were installing all this. Fight. Well, it sounds like it's got a, a weak signal. Who's your carrier? 
Oh, oh, I'm not on my iPhone right now. Yeah, but who's the company that you get your service from? Consumer Cellular. Okay. They use AT and T towers. Yeah. So you know? it may be that the, it may be that the signal is weak there. Sometimes the way you this is a problem with older iPhones, not the seven so much, but the way you remember the use of cell phones used to have those antennas. You'd pull them out, everybody would break them off every time. That was right, a better solution because right. the antenna was sticking up and it was doing a better job. Because people didn't like them, they put them in the phone. That's not as good a place for the antenna. So we're hanging it in the way. You can get in the way. And that's why you're seeing those bars move around as you hold it differently or turn your body. It means you're in a marginal area. It would happen less if you were near a cell tower. Not much to do to fix that except maybe try another carrier. I know maybe you love your carrier, but another carrier might have better cell reception where you are. There's nothing else you can do. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Um, it's, it's, I don't, and do you, are you split your time between San Diego and Virginia or? Um, well, I happen to be, um, here because there was a death in a family. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know. Is it worse where you are right now? Um, you know, I'm getting the same thing I got in San Diego. Same That's thing's happening. Okay. You know, but it just started happening, see, in the last six to seven months. And I've been to the Apple store, and they ran diagnostics on the telephone. Um, they said everything is fine. You know, um, but I never had this happen until, as I said, you know, the last several months. And they keep telling me, oh, you don't need a new phone. But I'm thinking, well. Well, I honestly. I use it. Yeah, yeah, you might need it. A new phone might fix this problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the battery, what's doing, doing, and you said the, carrier. well, you know. they, yeah, I don't know. Um, if it's happening both in San Diego and in West Virginia, mm -hmm. then I'm wondering if it's not, if it's the phone more than the carrier. Look, all, all, iPhones are fairly notorious for radio problems that are hard for Apple to diagnose, that they may not even acknowledge but I, my, right. I've seen this happen time and time again. Tell me about the battery thing, though. That's a little weird. The, the battery icon yeah. blinks on and off? Right. You know, so, like, one time it's black, one time it's half white. It goes back and forth. It's just like if I'm sitting talking, I mean, I mean within two seconds, uh, my bars have hopped back and forth. Does the, does, the, um, does the phone die rapidly after you charge it, or do you get a full day out of it? Um, I used to get a full day, you know, but I'm noticing now that it is dying more quickly. And when I checked the battery... It's about the age where this would happen. percent It's about 84% of the battery... Oh, that's health, very good. You call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Battery life is 84. That means... So what happens as you use a, a lithium-ion battery is its ability to charge deteriorates from 100%. You're mm -hmm. now at 84. That's still very good. Uh, you know, but what is strange is... As I said, you know, I thought it was just in San Diego until I was just talking to someone and I said, oh, no, it's here, too. Yeah, that and means so it's I your said, phone. Oh, gosh. That means almost yeah. certainly it's your phone. Did the Apple yeah. store recommend that you redo the phone, like you reset it and start over? Because sometimes that'll fix huh? this kind of thing. I know it's a pain in the butt. Well, I've had, you know, I've had whatever rebooted and everything. And, what, I, uh, what I would try know, is hook it up to a computer, back it up. You know, that if you hook it up by yes. cable... You back it up, and then wipe the phone. Do a complete reset. Okay. And before you restore, now you can restore and get it back to exactly the way it was, right? Because you've backed yeah. it up. Do the encrypted backup with a password. That way all your passwords and everything will get preserved. But okay. before you restore, see if the same thing's happening. Because now you've got a completely clean phone with no apps on it. Okay. This is what the store you know, should tell you to do, by the way. And then you can see if it still happens with nothing on it, like a fresh install... Then right. I think it's something wrong with the phone. And I did notice um, the other day when I was talking to someone, it's like this speaker. You know, I said, well, let me put you on a speaker. And it sounded muffled before, you know, and then I could hear them. They couldn't hear me. And so I said, you know, so there so might be uh, more going on with the phone and they just don't want to acknowledge whatever, you know, so. That's often the case, you know, and it, don't completely blame Apple. It's hard for them. They All they did is they ran their diagnostics and, and that is not a perfect system. So it's yeah. and unless they walk around with you through the day, it's hard for them to see <laughs> to see what's going on. So you can't you can't. It's not necessarily that they're trying to pull mm -hmm. one over on you, but um, 
It does sound like it might be the phone. I help, you know, even like when I was trying to make a, you know, a reservation, an airplane reservation, I had to call back three times because, like, right towards the end of the call or whatever, you know, they couldn't hear me again, you know, so, you know. Well, so there's a couple of possibilities. That's a fairly old iPhone now. It's almost four years old. Yeah. So yeah, it might be you know. time to get a new one. You could get a trade-in for that and probably not spend too much money. I I would get the yeah. iPhone 11. That's one possibility. Mm -hmm. It may be your carrier. That's not the greatest carrier in the world. And yeah. it's what's called an MVNO. And so they're using AT&T towers, but AT&T isn't necessarily going to prioritize you. If there's other AT&T people right. using the tower, you go down to the bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. So let me ask: Is it any? Is there a possibility with all of this five G stuff they're installing? If that has any effect no. on the use of no? First no. of all, it's almost certainly not where you are. They make a big right. deal about it, eh. especially AT and T. Yeah. <laughs> they decided to call four G five G five G E. It's still it's not yeah. it's not five G. So so okay. it, almost certainly <laughs> that's not the problem. The possibilities because I was okay until yeah. the last. Step no, that's a reasonable left, question. You know, so. But it, does, yeah. it should not affect you at all, no. In fact, if anything, it should make okay. you make it work better because they'll be upgrading towers. Um, I, it just could be it could be a couple of things. It's you know, Apple. You did the that you did the first thing right. I would have said, which is go to the Apple store. Yeah, I did that, and I've even and, and I even had a, the SIM card change once. You know, because they also have T-Mobile towers. You know, and then the same thing started happening and i said oh heaven help and they said well i think you better use the at&t sim card oh that's so, interesting you know but like you know i think it might just be time for a new phone okay if it happened I mean, with both at&t and t-mobile sims it's mm -hmm. the phone yes okay okay that's that's oh, right, absolutely right. proof that it's the phone because oh, okay. it can't be the okay. carrier it can't be the towers it has to be the phone Okay, well, I think I'll just get the upgrade. I think like that yeah. iPhone 11, you know, that yeah. you mentioned. You'll you know, like it. So. It's nice. Mm -hmm. All right. I know it's hard to give up your phone, but they don't really make these to, they don't want you to keep a phone for more than a couple of years. You know that, right? Well, that's true. You know, I mean, you know, just I kept asking. But who can afford it? It's a, upgrade, you know. It's crazy. And they said, oh, you don't need to, you know, but I've got too many problems all at once. Well, you don't have to go, if you want, you know, the 11 is going to be the most expensive. They still sell the 8. Or the 8s, you can you can get a, a little bit a brand new phone, but not the latest version, and that would be good. That would be an upgrade too. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you take and good care of it. They give me money towards. That's right. That, they'll trade know, it in. Phone, so yeah. you know, so yeah, they'll so, trade you know. it. In. But I mean, that you you take good care of it. If it's only at 84 mm percent, -hmm. if it's at 84 percent capacity, that yeah. you take good care of it. So oh, okay, thank it, you. Yeah, sometimes they come out of the factory messed up, but. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I enjoy your show all the time, so I do appreciate it. I Aren't mean, I you get kind. other people, you know, to listen to your. Thank you, Alice. Show. And my condolences. I'm sorry you're in West Virginia on a I sad thank you. mission. I yeah. Thank you. All right. Get home soon. I hope everything's okay. All right. Thanks, thank Alice. You. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches. You know, anything with a chip in it. 8888-ASK-LEO. Really, I'm kind of a grief counselor for tech users. If, you, <laughs> if you've got technology, it's painful. It's painful. And uh, we're, we're happy to be here and just kind of talk you down. 888-827-5536. Website is uh, techilabs.com. Techilabs.com. And uh, you can uh, head on over there. If you hear something on the air, our scribe, the great James DeRuvo, thank you, James, writes this all down as we go and puts it up there, including, most importantly, uh, links. That's, that's a big part of what uh, he does there. So if you hear something uh, or we mention a link or even if the chat room says, hey, you should check this resource out, uh, it's all there and it's free. There's no sign up. Techguylabs.com. Um. You can even leave comments there, too. So if you're hearing me talk about something, you say, hey, that, that, that happened to me, Leo. Here's what I did to fix it. You can do that, too. Techguylabs.com. And just go to the show. That we, every, every show has its own page on the website. Every, uh, every show is divided up into hour one, two, and three, and each hour divided up into segments, one, two, three, four. So you can go right to the part of it that you heard and say, hey, hey, here's, a, here's an idea. 
This is episode 1,662. Line two, Sam, Oceanside, California. Hello, Sam. Hello, Mr. Leo. Hello, Mr. Sam. Okay, I'm here for you. Well, I decided to get creative. Yes. So I went into my Orby, and I saw all these great uh, IP addresses on my on my uh, not my modem, excuse me, but my router. Yes. So I decided to track them all down and figure out which one was. Oh, which. nice. I, yeah. Yeah, and I went into Orby and I renamed everything, and then I saw these cute little icons <laughs> next to everything, yeah. and I said, "Gee, I'm going to change this to a printer, and I'm going to change <laughs> this to a network I- icon, and so on." Three hours and later. Three, <laughs> I found out a lot of the stuff didn't want to work any longer. Oh, no. Because some of them, for example, might have been a uh, a, uh, uh, a droid uh, icon, and it no longer is any longer, and so it wouldn't work. For example, Alexa got changed. <laughs> and now it didn't want to work. Oh, that's interesting. The Orbi, which is a, a mesh router system, may, like some mesh router yeah. systems, make assumptions or change behavior depending on the device. So if you told it it's you know a certain kind of device, maybe that that may, <laughs> that did something odd to it. Um, and, and you know, I didn't change. I didn't tell it anything differently other than change the icon yeah that shouldn't that know. shouldn't do anything right that's just a picture well, it's just here's what i would do as we say. have you tried powering it down uh and then powering it back up again because what i thought you were gonna oh, yeah yeah what i thought you were gonna say is i put all this effort in and then i and then it, it rebooted and everything went back to the other the old way but that's not the no, case you wish it would no that's not the case you know <laughs> and there were some items some printers that it would not let me change the icon on but there were other printers that said, yeah, no problem at all. Go yeah, ahead and change Something it. else. You must have changed but something now, else. Now they won't work. You know, the printer <laughs> might work, but the scanner function won't work. Oh, that's so, so weird. All these different little things. Here's what I would do. This is not as painful as it might sound. I would reset yeah. the router. So most routers, you are being included. There's a little tiny hole next to the uh, on-off switch. Uh, okay. And it's meant for a... Remember the old days on floppy drives? If you got a floppy stuck, there was a little hole. You'd sure. stick a paper clip in there, and it would press the release. It's the same thing. The paper clip or something like it will uh, small. You can poke into that hole. What you'll do is, uh, and this is true on almost all routers, um, you, you <clears throat> in the case of the Orbi, you do when it's on. Most routers, you unplug mm -hmm. them, poke the paper clip in there, and press the button. You'll feel a button and hold it and then plug it back in. In the Orbi, they say you can do this when it's on. So you hold it, and you have to hold it long enough for the light to blink. In the case of the Orbi, it'll blink yellow, but it's mm -hmm. that's true on most routers. It'll start blinking, and that means I've reset it. And now it's just like it came from the factory. It's like when you first set it up. And you probably remember okay. it's not a hard thing to to get it set up. You'll it'll you'll give it a new Wi-Fi password, you know, a few basic settings. I would suggest on all routers that you turn off what they call WAN administration, that is administering the router from outside the outside world. That's unless you absolutely know you need that, that's dangerous. I also always turn off universal plug and play. That's a feature that routers did because, well, Xbox made them. Uh, it lets a device inside your network change the routing settings, including opening holes in the firewall. And you don't want that because malware will do it too. So turn off UPnP. Uh, change the administrative password, turn off WAN mm -hmm. administration, set up your Wi-Fi using a strong password, and, and you're back. To, everything should work again. Now, the router that I have, which is the Orbi Mesh, does have a reset and a sync button on the back. Is yeah. that different from what you're talking about? Um, nope. The, the sync, what the sync is for is the satellites. So Orbi, right. like all, me all mesh systems, has a base unit and then satellites. If you want to mm -hmm. pair a new satellite, you press the sync button on the, on, the, on the access, on the main one, and you press the sync button on the satellite, and they'll say, oh, I see you, I see you, let's work together. Okay, why not? That's what that sync button's for. Mm -hmm. If you see a reset button, maybe that is it. I, uh, the Orbeez that I've seen, like other routers, 
don't want to make it too easy to reset. Okay. <laughs> so usually it's not an obvious button. It's a little hole that you poke. But if you have a reset, if it says reset and there's a button, press and hold it. I'm going to look. I might be wrong. I, it might be an on-off button. I think there's an on-off switch. I'm going to look yeah. at it. Yeah, okay. I think it's an on-off switch. I'll go back and look at it. But I think just reset, resetting the Orbi almost certainly will fix that. Probably okay. what happened when you changed the icons is the IP address got reassigned or changed. Uh, it just feels like the ports got changed or the IP address got changed, and that's why some stuff isn't working. I think resetting this it will is, work fine. This is what happens when you know a little bit too much about <laughs> you're. Work. No, you were. I would. You know what? I'm tempted to do the same thing. You were having fun. You were making it look pretty. Oh, I was making it look real nice. <laughs> Basically, I think there there are only a few things you do with computers. Uh, some people actually get work done, right? Some people are actually, you know, yeah. solving problems, doing spreadsheets. Most of us. That computer's way more than we'll ever need. We're not launching rocket ships. We're not running businesses. It's just a toy. And so, like with any toy, most of us, what we do with our computers is mess with them, configure them, <laughs> trick them out. It's like a car, right? You you putting, you know, you putting fuzzy dice in the window. You're you, you're playing with it. That's completely legitimate. I will. Ne that's what I do with my computers. I have. I don't need. I don't need a supercomputer on my desktop, let alone two or three. Well, I'm not designing the next Toy Story. So what do you do? I'm going to mess with the icons. Let's make some folders. And often, often, that's the kind of thing that gets you in trouble, right? <laughs> People who actually do work with their computers probably don't change the icons to match the device. I'm just saying. But, I, but no judgment, because that's what I do, too. I'm completely with you. I make up stuff. Last night, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'm going to tell you, because you know what? We're friends. Middle of the night, 4 o'clock. You wake up sometimes, 4 in the morning. You're wide awake. Do, 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 do. What am I going to do? Do, 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 do. I could read a book, but that'll wake my wife up. Do, do, do. I get up. I tiptoe out of the bedroom. I go and sit down at my office and my desk computer, and I install a wiki. I I set up a wiki. That's a kind of a web page you can you can modify in the web page yourself. I just said I thought I should have a wiki. I set it up, went back to bed. I don't need a wiki. <laughs> I like wikis. <laughs> uh, then I go back to bed and I fell asleep. Our show today. Thank you for the call. It's a great question, and I think resetting the router, just like you know, often resetting whatever it is. That's all you really need to do. 8888-ASK-LEO phone number. We're going to talk more. <laughs> I set up a wiki, four in the morning, but I got one. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number, line one, Pete in Clinton Township. Hello, Pete. Leo, how are you? I am well. How are you, sir? Good. I'm using those uh, shock ear... Um uh, the headphones. The aftershocks. The I aftershocks. I love them. I, I use them for my, for my my bike in the summertime. I'm from Michigan, but uh, when I'm doing it, it's wonderful. I love them. Is, aren't they great? Yes. Yes, they yeah, were a, a sponsor for some time, and yeah, we're big fans. They uh, they're bone conductance, which I yeah. always kind of laughed at. Because I remember from the 70s, remember the bone phone? I don't know, maybe you don't, but the Rolling Stone used to have ads for these things. They, there were <laughs> headphones you'd put over your show over your neck. And they yeah, I those. yeah, remember those? They yeah. they sounded terrible, but the aftershock oh. somehow they do it right, I guess. They do it right. <laughs> hey, I, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, the, the iPhone, I have an iPhone six, but I know you can replace the battery in it for hundred bucks. Yeah. yeah. How long? How long do you think that'll last? So that was uh, something Apple did because they got in a little bit of trouble. They didn't need to do it except maybe for public relations purposes right. but they decided to do a battery replacement program for 30 bucks you missed that oh, <laughs> um, okay. yeah you missed that but they still do it for 90 i think 90 or 100 bucks it'll last as long as the last one did the idea okay. is that ba all batteries right. work in somewhat of a similar way there's a chemical reaction that uh, is reversible so it stores energy and then it releases energy but the right. problem with that 
is that every time it does that, it breaks down the chemicals just a little bit. It wears itself out, in effect. I know it's good for 500 charges, right? Typically, lithium ion, it depends, but typically, lithium yeah. ion, the kind of battery you have in your phone, 500 full cycles. That's charged all the way up, char discharged all the way down. That's one. Uh, I think I think I, I think I might, I might do that because um, you'll get about two, at least two years out of it. Oh, that's perfect. In normal use, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. I appreciate that. I I, I just want. Uh, Highly recommend it. My mom has an iPhone 6s, and I keep saying, "Mom, let me get you a new one. Let me get you a new one." And she says, "No, dear." And she <laughs> she did the thirty dollar, thirty nine dollar uh, battery. She says it's like a new phone. She loves it. You so. Know, I, yeah, and yes, that's exactly right. She doesn't want to give it up. She says, no, honey, you can't give me that iPhone 11. It does not have a headphone jack. You know my mom? Uh, oh, yeah, well, I know your mom. She's just down the road in Providence, you know. I mean, she's... Oh, my, oh, my. <laughs> from Michigan? Okay, I got you. Uh, um, yeah, you know, I, I sent you my mom's thing by Italian spaghetti sauce. Did you ever make it? Oh, that was you? I did. It was fantastic, Clinton. Pete. Yes. I I now I know who you are. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. You have an old Italian mom too. Well, you you seventy five, getting getting going strong. That's good. Same age as my mom. Yeah, but oh boy, God, no. you know what I did? Because she doesn't cook anymore. She's gotten a little too old to do that. So for Christmas, I made her spaghetti sauce, and I FedExed it to her. Great expense, by the way. <laughs> Oh, it's she, okay. She was so surprised. She said, oh, a box God. came. It's full of spaghetti sauce. <laughs> oh, my God. How, how wonderful. You're a good son. She loved it. Are you kidding? But, oh, yeah. you know, I'm going to make... You reminded me. I forgot. I've got your recipe. I'm going to make your mom's sauce next time I make it. I forgot about it. All right. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you liked it. That's good. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Take, take care. care. Man. Yeah, send me... I will take anybody's spaghetti sauce recipe. I I will. I love that. <laughs> I don't eat the spaghetti. I just eat the sauce. So it's got to be good. It's got to be good. We I, we we decided no more pasta. It's, you know, it's a little fattening. So uh, we spiralize zucchini. You saute that up in a little olive oil, and then you put the sauce on it. So the sauce has to be good because the spaghetti's terrible. Uh, Dan in Fresno, California is next. Hi, Dan. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How's it going? Hmm. It's going well. How are you? Uh, pretty good. I'm having an issue with my 7S Plus and Bluetooth. Yes. Um, Boy, I'm, this is I'm, iPhone day, apps. isn't it? Yeah, I know. I mean, give me to wonder about quality and stuff with them. Some of the stuff that... They're, in my opinion, their quality control did go downhill. But remember, they're making 100 million iPhones a year. I know. I mean, <laughs> it, the fact is, if you think about it, their quality control is excellent. It's just that there are a lot of phones. So even a yeah. one one thousandth of 1% error rate is going to give you some errors. Yeah, I, I'm running 13.3. And um, what I used to, I have a pair of Backbeat, Backbeat Pro Plantronics headphones. Yes. That Bluetooth and I used to be able to get my, my battery level of those headphones on my status bar of my iPhone. Yeah. And since 13, I, can, I don't can. get it anymore. Yeah, because nor because Apple makes these Beats. So that's right. one of the unusual things about Beats headphones. It, you get that great battery information that you get from the AirPods as well and the uh, 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 from Apple. Because Apple, you know, it's an Apple company. Any other headphones, you'll have no, you have no idea. Um, I don't know. That's a really interesting question. Um, are they older? How old are the Power Beats? Uh, no, they're, this this pair I got this past year. Oh, okay. And I, I bought a new pair of uh, uh, one of these true wireless anchor. Yeah, see, the anchors won't do it, as you know. And, and they don't do it either. Yeah, they won't because they're not an Apple product. Only right. Apple products get that special treatment. Okay, <laughs> so it is just a 13.3. A yeah, I guess, with, but with, they'll fix it if they haven't. Uh, I hadn't heard this problem. But, it, yeah, it's something that they must have changed in 13.3. I bet you they'll fix it. You're not running a, a, a beta, are you? No. Okay. Because that... You were that would the other issue I'm having is is an Amazon Music. Yeah. As soon as I load Amazon Music, my headphones, my Bluetooth headphones disconnect. 
and that's the only app it happens in. So I would, uh, that, that this is related then, I would unpair the headphones and start over. I bet you that the headphone profile is slightly damaged or it's not working completely right. Those two things together are related, believe it or not. Yeah, Amazon Music dumps them out. That's weird. I would start over. And that's probably good advice anyway when you get a new version of the operating system. Maybe not a bad idea to unpair and repair just to make sure you have the latest profile installed. Hey, Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, coming up in a sec. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'm sure you've noticed that we are coming to you from the beautiful Twit LastPass studios. Uh, we love LastPass. We were so thrilled that LastPass wanted to uh, to buy the naming rights for our studio because we think it's such a great partnership. I've been a LastPass user. I've been recommending LastPass for a decade since they started. About five years ago, Steve Gibson, I, I've been I was telling Steve, our security guy, over and over, he finally said, all right, let me check it out. Talk to the guy who created LastPass, Joe Segrist. We've had him on Security Now, in fact, and uh, got all the deets. And he said, you know what? Thumbs up. This guy's doing it right. So Steve Gibson, a security guru, he uses LastPass. He, we, we love LastPass so much we use it here at Twit. It's our enterprise password vault. I should explain what LastPass is, shouldn't I? It's a password vault. It stores your, it makes your passwords. It stores your passwords. It stores all your vital data in a super safe, super encrypted vault that only you have access to. The, the business version has all sorts of cool additional features like multi-factor authentication where it can because part of what is what is a password it's all about identifying you right saying you are who you say you are you have the right to open the bank account or the web server or whatever right so LastPass memorizes the passwords generates passwords so you don't reuse them that kind of thing and with multi-factor it can go a step beyond it even beyond two-factor it can say well what's the ip address what's the geolocation what and, and use that that additional information to verify that the right people are using your precious business resources i mean you know that's important right they also have single sign-on that that's kind of the best of both worlds where you have convenience and security i love LastPass. it generates strong passwords really one really strong ones if you want i always use upper and lowercase letters numbers and punctuation and i make it as long as the site will let me it'll go up to 64 characters i think it even goes longer than that some sites you know they only say 12 whatever use the longest that the site will do it keeps track of it. I also, because I trust the LastPass vault, it's only decrypted on your device. By the way, every device you own, Mac, PC, Linux, uh, that's why I use LastPass because I use Linux a lot. And I need something like LastPass. Uh, Android, iOS, syncs it up everywhere. Only you can see it. They do everything to make it super strongly protected. Um, I use it. I trust it so much I put everything in there. Social security numbers passports driver's license that's my secure store that's where i put the stuff i really you know pa payroll information that kind of thing and by the way they really know that their responsibility is to keep your stuff safe that's why they engage trusted world-class third-party security firms to conduct routine audits all the time constantly testing the infrastructure testing the service testing the software it's the gold standard for confirming security and reliability, and you know you can trust LastPass because they take it seriously. AES-256, PBKDF-2 to make sure brute force is impossible, TLS to protect against man in the middle, all of the acronyms that Steve Gibson would demand. We use LastPass Enterprise at Twit. I use LastPass Families at Home, LastPass Premium for individuals. There's a LastPass plan for you. Go to lastpass.com slash twit. There are very few companies that I would say can name this studio. Our very first choice was LastPass. We are here in the LastPass studios. We use LastPass. So should you. LastPass.com slash twit. Thank you, LastPass, for supporting the tech guy. Hello, Chris Marquardt, photo guy. Hello. How are you? I am great. You're about to go. I'm just looking at the list. <laughs> <laughs> of expeditions you're about to leave. Chris does the does photo workshops. It's sometimes, getting crazy. Sometimes you just do them at home at the, at the viewfinder villa in uh, near Hanover, Germany. But sometimes, sometimes you do them on the road. Next, I do. Next yeah. month you're going to Lake Baikal in Siberia in February. Okay, yes, I will. Crazy. 
Then in March, you're going to be in Ethiopia. Wow, that's cool. Have yes. you done that before? That sounds like a new destination. I've been there before, and th that's why I'm going back, because it's so awesome there. Uh, Bhutan in April, that's, of course, where the uh, the gross happiness product is. The is kingdom of happiness. Happiness yes. is what it's all about in Bhutan. Beautiful pictures there. And then Kyrgyzstan in May and June. So you... You just got this, and you people can find out more about these workshops if they go to your website, which is discoverthetopfloor.com. Is it the case these days, if you're a photographer, it seems to me all my favorite photographers have side hustles. They're doing workshops, they're teaching, <laughs> they're writing, right? You have to have a side hustle. It, I, I'm, you know, I'm self-employed, so I have to have multiple legs to stand on just in case uh, one goes away, which well, can always smart. happen. It's so. the smart thing to do. You have and, to, you and have to boy, the places where people could be staff photographers are dwindling. You know, oh, there's not much of that anymore, no. No, newspapers Definitely and magazines not. used to have people on staff, not anymore. But there are a lot of people who want to learn, who are interested in in seeing right. great locations. So Who was it? Was it the Chicago Tribune that fired all their uh, photographers? And, uh, and I think the Chicago Sun-Times. Sun-Times. And they that, gave yeah. the reporters iPhones and said, you, iPhones. you, you do it. Yeah. <laughs> you do it. And the photography didn't really turn out that good no. after that. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a shame. I still, uh, every year I look at, uh, New York Times does it a few a few places do it, UPI, the best photos of the year. And when a, when a, when a, a journalistic photographer is on his or her game. They get amazing shots because you're where the action is. Anyway, and you know how to make things look good, and yeah. you can, and it takes some real skill to do it. Anyway, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about <laughs> what you want to talk about. Starlink. I want to talk about Starlink. What's so, Starlink? A couple of weeks ago, uh, SpaceX sent a rocket into space with sixty satellites on board. Uh, which are which have become or which are part of the Starlink uh, satellite network, which in, in its final goal has to cover the entire world with fast satellite internet. Ooh, I love it! Gigabit device. internet every corner of so the go, world, from Kyrgyzstan to Bhutan and everywhere in between. Exactly. So uh, at this point, they have about 180 satellites up there. Um, they had three launches of about 60, and they are launching a few more, a few more. We're talking, I think... They want to go to 12,000. Well, the last thing I heard is that they want to do 24 more launches in 2020, <laughs> in this year. So that'll bring this up to about 1,400. And then until until 2027, they want to have 12,000 satellites yeah. up. They'll be operative, um, they said, this year. It won't be as they will as full in North feature. America. Yeah, in North America, yeah. um, and then they have another application pending with the FCC for another thirty thousand. So we're talking about forty-two thousand <laughs> which would satellites, roughly, which would more than triple the number of satellites right now. Exactly, and they're not the only ones. There is uh, other other ones who want to go into that business. There's OneWeb, there's Telesat, there's Amazon, so and probably can. others. So. so uh, I know astronomers are not thrilled about this because there's all well, these thoughts in the sky. we're talking about many, many satellites in lower Earth orbit. And lower Earth orbit means that they will be somewhat visible. And that's a bit of a problem because the sun will bounce. Everyone might have seen a satellite in the sky. You you watch the sky and all of a sudden you see this one yeah. tiny dot moving across the sky. And um, there will be more of those. And yeah, the, the problem... Uh, for photography is that this is going to to have an impact on things um, the, that might have a problem for astro astronomers and for astrophotographers and you can actually actually at this point you can see the Starlink network those 60 satellites that, that have been shot up a couple of weeks ago are still moving to their final orbit which is about 330 miles above us and while they move into orbit, you can see that chain of bright dots crossing the sky. Yeah, but like they don't train. stay in that train. They, no, no, they, they disperse out. over time. Yeah. They move to their final orbit, and then they will also turn around, and the reflections will and become And they even painted the latest batch black, right? So that they... Nope, nope. They painted one of them black. Oh, one. Okay. Well, they said they don't, didn't even say black. They said they have an experimental coating on it that will reduce the reflectivity. Uh, yeah, layman's term, that means painting it black, but... This is just a test because 
a satellite up there is uh, exposed to the sun and painting it black might yeah. mean that it's getting too hot. So they're yeah. testing this on one and uh, that might change things with. So it's not a given that this is going to happen. I want it to happen because I want to be able to do this show everywhere. I want to be able to go with you to Lake Baikal up there in Siberia and still be doing the show on a Saturday. I'm Sunday. with you on that. I'm, but Wouldn't that I'm, be I'm, awesome? I'm, I have two very, very different kinds of feelings about this. The, on the one hand, oh, awesome. This could be wonderful. Yeah, but yeah. Um, if you look at visual observations with telescopes or even radio astronomy, the frequencies they're using, it's... Well, they got FCC it, appro approval, though. I mean, they... It they do, but the FCC doesn't care about astronomy. I don't think they do. Well, they ought to. So, <laughs> so they're working on it. Um, they have told astronomers that they are trying to reduce the what they call albedo the the reflectivity of them but yeah again this is this is a pretty widely discussed topic in in uh among astronomers and astrophotographers oh, I know so they're not happy but you know what that's one tiny constituency well i mean if you look up in the Mark sky zuckerberg might... wants this to happen well, if Elon Musk wants this to happen too, Jeff so, Bezos wants this to happen. Yes. He's also doing it. So, so I think one thing's for sure: the night sky, as we know it, will uh, will will be changed forever. It's not well. Do, do, the have they future. projected? I mean, honestly, you're not going to be able to look up and see glittering dots up there. Well, they they are at they they are in magnitude five, which is still visible under ideal conditions with your bare but eyes. Not in a city. Not in a city. Is a big and we're place. talking about. When, with, once they are fully deployed, we're talking about over 100 at any given moment in the sky. You, so, 100 above us at any given time. Yeah, that's kind of the, the numbers. Well, you can I've look read, between so. the 100. That's a big sky. <laughs> well, let's let's see where this goes. But Astronomers now, even now, an eye on it. when they do uh, long time exposures, th they do many overnight because they're going to have to throw out a handful because of a satellite going through the exposure. Well, as a photographer, you will probably have to use different methods if you want to do these photos without stripes but on them. But think of all the we're, great pictures you're going to get. We're talking photo stacking. We're talking <laughs> photo stacking to remove these things. Or maybe yeah. we'll come up with completely new art forms that include exactly. the satellites in them. Someday, yeah. maybe in 2028, you're going to be on this show and you say your assignment, we've got down to the letter S, is to take a picture <laughs> of satellites. Starlink photos. Starlink yes. photos in the sky. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm torn, but I think that the benefit of having global high-speed internet is kind of outweighs, oh, some, you know, astronomers can't get a picture. Put a telescope up there or something, you know, just, I don't know. Well, we have telescopes in, yeah. in orbit, so... Come on. Those will You've seen the stars. They don't orbit. change that much. Thank you, Chris. Thank Happy you. photos of those satellites. So you didn't really say one way or the other. You you think they should stop? Is it a bad idea? No. Well, I mean they have they have they have methods. Uh, Get around it. Well, they they're they're offering the scientists uh, data about when the satellites will be where. So you um, you you'll go. have to work around them. They are offering to uh, to not use certain frequency bands that are important for radio astronomy. Figure there it. will be software that I mean you can now already do that with uh, stacking them. If you the median, can figure out thing on them. how to shoot a machine gun through a propeller by syncing it up to the propeller, which you they did in World War One, you can figure out how to shoot around some satellites in the sky. Come on, uh, it'll be harder. It'll, it'll be harder. It'll be the special. A, lo a lot of people are not happy about it, but I know. Um, but then on the other hand, yeah, I mean. I travel, so I want, oh, I want my internet. Every, but it's not just a want. I mean, honestly, global internet changes everything. It's oh, and, yes, it, and does. it really helps for people who don't have internet. Now, I, you know, if you have to pay hundred dollars a month for it, that's not going to be good. But I don't think you will. I think the whole idea is just to make a ubiquitous internet for uh, for everybody. Let's hope that's the yeah. case. Well, yeah. Wouldn't that wouldn't that be a great thing? I think it would be a positive, yeah. uh, net positive outcome. Yeah. YouTube everywhere. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Technology it's just, marches on. Just a few more on. years until they are all up there. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's actually a great question. It's a really interesting question. Let's hear it for the girl. 88, 88, 
Ask Leo the phone number. I am your tech guy here, poised and ready to help you with your tech problems. By the way, if you're following along with Chris Marquardt and our monthly photo assignments, the assignment now is the letter J. We've got oh yeah, all the way to the letter J. It's Journey. So the way this works is not a competition. There's no prize. It's just uh, to encourage you to take pictures, whether it's with your fancy camera or your smartphone, does not matter. Take a picture illustrating the word, the concept, the idea, journey. It does not have to be the rock band journey, although it could be. <laughs> and upload it to uh, Flickr, which is a great free photo sharing site. I'm a big fan of Flickr. And uh, we have a, a group there. Pretty big group, too. I think it's almost 12,000 people in it. The Tech Guy group. Join that group. Submit it. You can submit up to one photo a week for the next couple of weeks to our photo pool but to make it uh, eligible to be reviewed by chris please put the tag tg journey in there for tech guy journey tg journey one word renee silverman our moderator will say oh thank you i got it and she'll put it in the pool and then chris will pick three photos this is the only reward he'll pick three photos mention your name <laughs> and criticize your photo <laughs> on the air in a couple of weeks three weeks maybe journey is the assignment back to the phone's and James in Maine. Hello, James. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, yes, my brother. Leo the door. Hello. Yes, you are Leo the door? I am Leo the door. Wait, oui, wait. Oui. <laughs> Sometimes they used to call me Lion the door. Oh, Lion the door. Are you yes. French, James? Or are you. Uh... No, I am neither. I just speak French. Well, you have a very nice French accent. Oh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you're French. You're French, dude. No. Where are you from? Je, no, je parle français. Je suis Dominique. La Dominique. La Dominique. Well, that's a that's a French was a French colony, right? So you, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You grew up speaking French, right? Yeah, I grew up speaking French parce que j'étais élevé dans Martinique. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. I'll tell you. Yeah. Beautiful place. How has it been in the hurricanes? Has Dominic survived? The... Um, I have not been there for a while. Yeah. We were, two years ago, I was in uh, the Virgin, British Virgin Islands, and they were just, British they had Island. just been devastated. It was so, so, so tough. Yeah. What can I do for you, Monsieur James? Um, yes. I am tr looking to register a domain name. Yes. But I do not want to use www. You don't have to nowadays. No need. That's not part of the domain name. That's just a, a convention. Okay. To say at this domain name lives a World Wide Web server. But nowadays, of course. So nobody bothers with a dub dub dub. No, because www is six six six. You want to be six six six? What is this? A, sa a satanic site? <laughs> w is a six. Oh, I didn't know that. It's also a, the letter with the most syllables in the English language. Why they chose W. That is my problem. W. W. That's right there. Nine syllables. And you haven't even gotten to the domain name yet. Six, six. Six, six, six. Okay. All right. My, my biggest problem is that in order to pay for the registration, I need a credit card. Yes. And there are a set of us that are selected to be restricted from credit card. So what I want to a uh, company that I can get a money, postal money order, and pay to buy postal money order. Boy, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that yet. We, I use my domain registrar. So the way this works is there is a, a non-governmental organization. It used to be the U.S. Commerce Department, but now it's uh, no government runs it. It's called ICANN, the International Inter Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. They're the ones who make sure that the names don't collide. And they, in turn, maintain the 13 root servers where the big phone book for all of those names is kept because somebody has to say well when you go to yahoo.com that translates to 132.1.4.9 and that's a it's like a phone book and that has to be maintained those 13 canonical name servers then serve all the other ones and in order to get in that big book you have to go to a registrar and I can uh, authorizes a variety of companies to do this. There are quite a few of them. Uh, and that's the good news. There probably is somebody that will take postal orders. 
Um, I use Hover.com. I'm just going to go to Hover.com and see if you can pay with anything besides a credit card. I bet you there's somebody that will pay via that can <laughs> will let you pay via uh, Bitcoin. Would you be willing to use that, James? No, postal money order. You want postal money order? Yeah, I can go to the post office, buy a money order, yeah. money, and send it to you. And once you receive your money, then you can and release my my name. You can use PayPal at Hover, but it, yeah. I don't see that you can use uh, a postal money order. So it may be, I don't know what the regulations are. You know, they do want to make sure that every domain name is attached to somebody. You know, that there, and so I don't know if this is your situation, but if you wanted to create a, a domain completely anonymously, um, you wouldn't want to use a credit card. I guess you could buy a, you know, Visa gift card at the store and use that one time only. Um, I'm just looking to see if the chat room. Oh, look at that. Scooter X. He is our chat mod. He's also a wizard. You must type really fast, Scooter X. He's a wizard with the Google. He has found something called moneyorderdomains.com. Don't have a credit card or PayPal account? You can still purchase domains from Money Order Domains. You open an account. You send payment via money order. Payment received, credited to your account. You can then purchase domains. So the they do take postal money orders from the U.S. or Canada as well as Western Union and MoneyGram. So the your 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 query has been answered, James, by our stellar chat room, moneyorderdomains.com. I've never heard of these guys. And I guess there is no anti anonymity requirement. Because that's that's how you would do it and be completely anonymous. And I could see there's lots of good reasons why you might want to have a domain without having your address published. In fact, most domain registrars will offer you uh, anonymous uh, registration so that you can they know your domain and I can knows your your address but they don't publish it publicly otherwise it is so there you go James moneyorderdomains.com thank you chat room Stan in Victorville California hi Stan Leo Laporte hey Leo how you doing I'm well how are you not bad listen I had a question about my internet service okay okay I have a I use spectrum and they have an external modem, and I wanted to buy a new router. And I don't know exactly what type of router to buy, all-in-one or because Best Buy has no idea. Yeah, don't ask Best Buy. <laughs> so you're probably going to use Spectrum's cable modem, right? You can use uh, your own, by the way. Uh, Spectrum, uh, every, every cable Internet provider has a list of acceptable modems. So you can, if you don't want to pay the rental fee, you can buy your own. I use, actually, what I would suggest, I use a Netgear CM1000. And what I would suggest is you go to the wirecutter.com and see their ratings. But I would not get an all-in-one. I would get a separate cable modem and then a separate wireless, if you want to use Wi-Fi, uh, router. If you don't yeah, want to use Wi-Fi. Yeah, I want to buy a new router. Yeah. You're going to use continue to use your cable modem? Same thing, I'd recommend going to the wire cutter. If you want to get a mesh system that spreads out, if you've got a big area, like a house with several thousand square feet, I recommend Eero. They are a sponsor, but it's also my recommendation. They're the best. Um, but also Netgear makes excellent stuff. Asus is my favorite routers. And just, you know, um, if you want to be up to date, get one with Wi-Fi 6. Be a little more expensive. Trust the wire cutter, though. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yeah, it's time to talk computers, tech, uh, home theater, digital photography. We got your smartphones. We got your smart watches. Phone number is 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. As we converse, you and I, uh, James DeRuvo, our scribe, writes it all down, puts it up on the website, techguylabs.com. Links will be there. All the information. You don't have to write it down. James is going to do that for us. And then, uh, after the fact, we end up putting audio and video from the show there, too. So you can go back look at previous shows. Uh, everything's up there. And it's free. There's no sign-up. There's no charge. Our great sponsors pay for it, so you don't have to. TechGuyLabs.com uh, Let's go on with the show to Jay 
in Providence, North Carolina. Hello, Jay. Hey, Leo. I found out that I can start an app a little bit quicker and easier if I unlock my keychain access in Mac OS, but I'm wondering if it's safe to leave it unlocked. Well, that's interesting because normally in Mac OS, the minute you log in, it unlocks your keychain. The keychain password, in normal, unless you've changed it, is the login for your Mac, and it's unlocked the minute you log in. So you might have you changed your keychain password? Not recently. Is it the same as your login? Yes. Okay. So as far as I know, it's being unlocked. You're saying if I go to it and uh, and open it and unlock it, it things happen faster, which would make sense, by the way. A lot of apps use that keychain to store passwords and other important information. Um, but in theory, it is unlocked the minute you unlock your Mac. So I'm better off to not go in there and lock it. <laughs> That's right. That's a good point. And by the way, it's why it's fairly important uh, with the Macintosh that you have a good password. Uh, you know, we we talk all the time about, you know, threats and malware coming in over the transom and things like that. The biggest threat, the one that almost nobody really even attempts to protect you against, is the threat of somebody sitting down at your computer. Sometimes security experts call that the evil maid problem. The, which, by the way, is ridiculous, but it's assuming that you've left your laptop in the hotel and the maid comes in to make up the room and sits down at your computer and starts messing with it. That's the evil maid conundrum. If you have a good password, if you lock your, your dad, don't you, anybody who's ever worked in an office and left their computer unlocked, gone to lunch, knows you don't do that because you guarantee you there's a coworker who's going to send an email from your account that's very embarrassing. So you know when you get up from your computer at work, even if it's just to run to the bathroom or go get a cigarette, you always lock it, right? Same thing, at, 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 you know, whenever you leave your computer at home, you should lock it. And once and they have a good password, this is why I think it's really important uh, that, you know, all Windows PCs, almost all Windows PCs now support biometric recognition, face recognition or fingerprint, which is great. They call it Windows Hello. Apple still doesn't do that on their desktops. I wish they would. I hope they do start doing that. But they certainly do it on their laptops and their phones. Yeah, you don't need to lock it. Just lock your computer, and that locks it. So if you're not going to be at your computer, if you stand, get up and walk away, log out. That's locking both the keychain and the computer. I see. Yeah. Don't, in other words, don't mess with the keychain. <laughs> now, when you, if you explicitly say, give me keychain, open the keychain access app, it may ask you for a password at that point just to verify that whatever it is you're about to do, you really do have the right to do it. But apps have access to it without doing that uh, as soon as you're logged into your computer. One thing that Apple does really well now with keychain, you can generate good passwords with keychain. Keychain, if you only use Apple products, and that's the big if. But if you only use Apple products, Keychain can be an excellent password manager. It's got a strong store. It protects it. It synchronizes through iCloud. So you can have it on your iPhone and your Macintosh, your iPad too. But the minute you use something that's not an Apple product, you, you're out of luck. So it's only good for people who only use Apple products. But it's, it's a generate. take a look at the generating passwords, storing them, uh, and, and filling them. It's a very useful uh, thing, but you shouldn't need to go into keychain access in the normal course of events unless you're doing something special. And don't change the password; you'll regret it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Great to talk to yeah. you again. Take care. Yeah, that's a a little known and great feature, I think, of Apple. I have to say uh, that Apple probably because they're looking uh, <laughs> uh, over the fence at Microsoft and going, "Oh boy." I don't, oh boy, because Microsoft every day is fixing some problem or other. There was a big, huge flaw that Microsoft fixed last Tuesday on Patch Tuesday. And there always is, right? And I'm sure Apple's going, oh, there, but for the grace of God. So they, Apple does, I think, a very good job of thinking of ways to secure your system. And they're getting better and better at it. A Macintosh out of the box is pretty darn secure. They have built-in file encryption called File Vault that, that encrypts your hard drive. You should always have that turned on. It's turned on on most modern Macs, any Mac with a T2 chip in it. They have Gatekeeper, which prevents you know uh, 
malicious programs from kind of running on their own keeps you kind of safe too it reminds you hey you know you sh you, what you got this on the internet is <laughs> is that okay uh, all of those things i think work quite well and they're fairly unobtrusive keychain is one of the less known but i think quite good features of mac os ed in san gabriel is next hi ed leo laporte the tech guy hi leo uh, hey. long time first time uh, welcome i was just telling the, i was just telling the screener this has to do with how you started your show all right um, I'm one of those people that never cleans his inbox. Um, I had a Gmail, and thanks to you, I connected my Yahoo to it. Good so man. I had all my emails at one spot. In one giant uh, inbox. Yes. Uh, 94,000 worth of <laughs> inboxes. <laughs> all right, you got me beat. Um, so, <laughs> well, I was, the strange thing of it is, and I actually watched Hack last night on Netflix about uh, uh, the analytical. Oh, and, oh! I haven't seen it. And, oh, hack! Oh, huh? Hack! Yeah, very, very good. It's all, and it all starts out with somebody wanting their information and going to court, and how it actually helped to bring the whole thing down. Wow! I got to watch that. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. In the start, in the start of it, it talks about how you are now just—they're uh, just mining your data. So everywhere you go, and how many times has have you uh, talked about something and then suddenly seen it? in an advertisement and how the, your mics are on. Yeah. So my Constantly. daughter and I were talking, my daughter and I were talking over the phone. She was telling me how many emails she had over 25,000. And I tried to make her feel better and said, you know, I have 94,000. Dad has 94. <laughs> I want, and I want to clean mine up this year. So I started by going through my Gmail and I would pick um, one of my promotional emails by a, a vendor I would search under that name, and then I would just go through and delete. Delete them all. Put them all in the trash. And one more thing to do, unsubscribe. If it's got at the bottom of the email, yeah. unsubscribe. Yeah. I actually started with the unsubscribed first, the ones that I don't that I don't read. And I have an uh, iPhone 11, and it actually comes up and tells me, you're not using this particular one anymore. Do you want to unsubscribe? Yeah, Apple's, getting, Apple's really done a nice job with that. I love that feature. That's great. But here's my conundrum. Yes. <laughs> Two days later... I open, I turn on my iPhone. I have 400, or now I just have barely over 500 emails in, in Gmail, and I can't find them. I oh. went into trash. I tried to go back as far as I could, and re literally, it only goes back to uh, the beginning of December of 2018. You think you accidentally Yahoo, deleted them? I don't know because I didn't check anything. I didn't you have looked. Remember that the, that the default in Gmail is not to delete, but to archive. Okay, I well. I, so I when you I, well, first thing I would do when you go to your Gmail on the left, you know you have your list of your folders. There's a yeah. more button there. People often miss that. There's a lot more folders there than you see. Press the more button. Okay. Make sure you look through all of those folders. There's also under the more button. There's a folder that's the most important for this particular task: all mail. Everything in okay. every folder, including archives and the trash can, should show up in all mail. If you don't see anything in all mail, it's gone. Okay. Well, then, yeah, because the day after when I pulled it up and, it, and uh, it, it'll give you numbers and how many you have, yeah, and, and all of them seem to be in trash. But it says you have 30 days to empty the trash. That's right. And, and then the day, after, the day after that, they were gone. I would check the archive. It might have gone into archive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a great place to start. Gmail, and if they're gone, G G if they're, gone they're gone. There's no, as far as I know, there's no Gmail unerase <laughs> utility. Right. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah, well, if I told the caller yesterday, if, if it's free, you're not going to get any text. Yeah, that's right. So. Yeah. And, uh, and and honestly, you know, uh, you just gave yourself inbox zero. I think I think you should say, I declare email bankruptcy when we were talking about that. I'm at inbox yeah. zero. If you if you haven't heard from me from an email you sent some time ago, send me another one. Okay. It's okay yeah, to do that. Good. Anybody yeah. who thinks well, email is a robust system for communication these days is sadly mistaken. Yeah, it's, it's it's a robust way to advertise. Yeah, yeah. Our mail, our email boxes are way too full to actually get through the clutter to get to your mail. I don't even bother anymore. Hey, thanks for the call. I I, I would look under all mail. Look at all mail. It's underneath the more, and that's if if you've got it, that's where it'll be. That's where it'll be. But you're right. Yeah, maybe you. Yeah, it's easy to hit the backspace button by accident, and maybe you did that 31 days ago, and now it's gone. But it's possible. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, your tech guy. More of your calls coming up.
The Tech Guy Podcast brought to you today uh, in more ways than one by Zapier. Zapier is the best kind of automation. It's a system I use. It's on the website, Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R.com slash tech guy to check it out. That lets you connect all the things you use to other things you use to do things automatically. <laughs> I use Zapier in so many ways. I'll give you an example. This maybe it'll help you understand what Zapier can do. Every time I'm, you know, every morning, actually throughout the day, I'm looking at tech news, right? And I see a story that I want to save for later. Uh, I have a Zapier script, so I'll be reading it in my newsreader. If I star an article, Zapier, boom, leaps into action, immediately bookmarks it. Uh, on the website Pinboard, because that's supported by Zapier, and then carefully formats it and makes a line in a Google Drive spreadsheet that Karsten then uses to make the rundowns for our shows. And all of that by just one click, because I set it up with Zapier. Zapier connects with over 1,500 apps, apps you use in business, apps you use at home, home automation, you don't want to be wasting hours of every day moving email from spreadsheets to e email and spreadsheets to the CRM and reminding yourself to do stuff. Just set it up with Zapier. Zapier makes business easy. You can engage leads instantly, automatically import new customers, notify your team about opportunities. And Zapier does one thing extra special. They support multi-step zaps. So you set the trigger. Sun goes down. Uh, I just talked to a new contact, a new lead, whatever that trigger is. And then Zapier leaps into action and can do multiple things with one zap. That's what they call them. It's not programming. It is programming, but it's not like programs. It's easy for you to do. It's so, you're so simple, so straightforward. Automatically tweet every time I get on the scale. Zapier. <laughs> I use it in so many different ways. I've been a happy Zapier customer for years. You don't have to ask a developer for help. You don't have to write any code. You can do it. You really can. Four and a half million people use Zapier every day. In fact, on average, they save 40 hours a month by using Zapier. That's, that's a work week without doing anything. Look, this is what computers were invented for. This is what the internet was invented for. Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R.com. Make more time to grow your business right now through the end of the month. Try Zapier free. Zapier dot com slash tech guy free 14 day trial go play with it and see what it can do if you do any home automation if you have any workflow at all zapier can help it integrates with 1500 apps everything you use zapier.com slash tech guy i'm such a fan i'm actually uh, uh, i'm a proselytizer for zapier i tell people all the time you gotta try zapier it's great Thank you, Zapier, for supporting our podcast, by the way. And thank you for supporting it by going to zapier.com slash tech guy. Now on with the show. That is the Lady Laura theme song. Our musical director, Lady Laura. Our official scribe, James DeRuvo. Our phone angel, Kim Schaffer. They bring you this show. I'm just here for the ride, Leo Laporte, your tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO, line three, Stephen yes. in San Antonio. Hello, Stephen. Good afternoon, Leo. Good afternoon. I, if, if you have time, I have two questions. But I I'm got all the time in the world. Just go right ahead. I'm befuddled on the first one. I have a wireless HDMI that I stream to my TV set because I don't have a smart TV set. Mm -hmm. I stream to my TV set from my computer. Mm -hmm. And even on your program, it'll, it'll hiccup. Yeah. And some of the other channels like Wii TV or uh, USA channels that I watch, it'll blurt out. It'll, it'll hiccup. <laughs> sometimes it even, sometimes it even uh, just crashes. Oh, well, that's not good. My experience with wireless video, HDMI, is that it isn't really that good. Um, the hiccup is bandwidth or packet dropping. So if it can't keep up, it'll it'll skip ahead. So you're watching it, – it, It's if you think about it, what it's trying to do is hard. You're watching video, 
and it's sending the video in little chunks we call packets. Here's a packet, here's a packet, here's a packet, here's a packet. If it's going to play back in order, it's going to play those packets in order. One, two, three, four, five, six. If you get six before you get five, you can't play six first because it'll be flipped. So you have to wait until you get five. Sometimes packets don't arrive or they arrive late. And so what? there's a couple of things that digital stream can do. If you're streaming it on a computer, it can do buffering. That's what that buffering means. The computer says, look, before I start playing the video, I'm going to get ahead by, well, let's say, 30 seconds. That's the buffer. Then if uh, a packet's late, I can wait. I'll just keep going. The buffer will get smaller, but I will be able to play those in order because I'm ahead 30 seconds. After a while, if you drop packets, the buffer gets smaller and smaller. If it gets to zero, then you have to rebuffer. You've seen that happen. Rebuffer, build a new buffer. That means the video will be paused. It'll build up the buffer again, and then it'll continue on. So it's using that extra get ahead to kind of store extra packets so that it has some leeway. But you're doing it with a wireless HDMI. It can't do that. It has no buffer. It has no memory. It's not a computer. It's just a a, a radio so if it misses a packet or a packet comes out of order it just drops it so you'll get it'll jump ahead it may in fact uh do other things as well it may lower the quality so all of a sudden it gets blurry and like very chunky because it's it can't keep up with the high quality and the higher quality the product the program you're watching the harder it's going to get for that it has to do with interference you know it's a radio so if there's interference in the house it depends on what frequency it's using usually they use pretty low frequencies like 900 megahertz those are good because they go through walls and they and you know some things will interfere with them a cordless phone would interfere with them um and who knows, your neighbor's refrigerator might, too. There's lots of things that could interfere with it that could slow it down. So that's just a, kind of the nature of, of wi streaming wirelessly via radio is that you're going to get these artifacts. Um, how can you make it better? Well, get closer, to get the receiver and the transmitter closer together. Uh, watch lower quality content. If you're watching me on YouTube, for instance, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a little gear. You can choose, instead of 720p, which is high def, you could choose 480p. You could choose a lower quality or even 360. That should hiccup less. Things like that that will help. But honestly, that's part of the problem with uh, with radio. Sending video, which is a lot of bandwidth over a radio, is, you know, it's it's going to have problems. That, that kind of makes sense because yeah. in the mornings, in the mornings and during the afternoons, nothing. But once it gets to mid-afternoon, it starts to start hiccuping and crashing a lot more. Go. So there's so interference. I'll to, yeah. I'll have to talk to my neighbors. And uh, and with radio, you can move. You know, radio is a black art. You know, you can move it around. You can reposition it. Not necessarily even closer. Sometimes just different is enough. Is it, into, is it a wine grad? What are you using? I don't even remember. The first one I got wouldn't even... Uh, wouldn't even do it, and this one's been working pretty good. Yeah, it's a it's a extender. Yeah, it's probably a wine grad. There are a couple of companies that make this. Yeah. I, you know, it's it's convenient because you don't have to have a wire. You know, who wants to have an HDMI cable stretched across the room? That's no fun. But uh, you're just going to have to put up with occasionally some issues with it. Uh, and some of that will have to do with what frequency it's using, how powerful the transmitter is, how nearby the receiver is, the positioning of both. You know, all of that can be fussed around with. It, you know, it's very much like, remember the rabbit ears? Remember in the old days of TV, you'd have rabbit ears in the top and you'd adjust them and get that signal just right. That's the difference between analog and digital. With analog, you'd get snow or you'd get ghosting. You'd, the picture would deteriorate, but you'd still get one. With digital, if it either works or it doesn't. And if it doesn't work, pick, pick, pick. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this. Jose, Ontario, California. Hello, Jose. Hi, Leo. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Thanks for calling. What um, can I do for you? Well, I have a uh, laptop. It's a Dell, uh, the two-in-one. Yes. Uh, with a touch screen. But anyway, ev every now and then, uh, the screen started going black for a few Ugh. seconds, and, and then it would come back. And so uh, after about the second time that it did that, I just shut it down because I don't want to risk uh, 
been dying on me. Here's my and, guess. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm not holding it. I'm not looking at it. But this is not uncommon. It's especially common with two-in-ones because you're bending the screen around all the time, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's a little ribbon cable that goes from the motherboard, which is in the keyboard base port part of it, up into that screen. And it's not at all unusual on a laptop as that cable gets bent back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for it to start to become less reliable, fray. Maybe it's frayed, mm -hmm. maybe it got, came loose, but that's exactly, uh, well, it's one of the symptoms. Eventually what happens, of course, the screen stops working. Right. The good news is if that's the problem, it's an easy, it's an easy fix. You could do it uh, or Dell could do it. I don't know if you bought a, a depot service, uh, from Dell, but uh, they'll, you know, you could drop it off, they'll fix it, put it back, and it shouldn't be too expensive. Before you assume it's hardware, though, that's, in my experience, the most likely scenario. It could be drivers or some software issue. So it'd be a good idea to make sure you got up to date drivers for the thing, um, you know, that you've updated your operating system. Certainly anybody using Windows these days must, must keep it up to date. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm betting it's more likely the cable. That, I've seen that happen so many times, and that's exactly the oh. symptom. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just by doing an update, uh, them, that would be the first step. Just I would, uh, yeah, always, that. anytime there's a video problem, the first thing everybody does, you got to do, check the drivers. Um, you'll get them from Dell. You could actually get rid of the old drivers, download the new ones from Dell, install them just to make sure. Probably that's okay. not it, but... You never know. Is it is it when you're doing any particular thing, like watching video or anything like that? And, and it was, uh, well, normally um, I do a couple small Excel spreadsheets, and then I on YouTube I, I get a lot of... Uh, oh, you're watching, you're watching a video. Yeah. Is that when it's yeah, going, no, going dark? It, uh, it, it, when I noticed that, that when I was hitting, like, control, like, do control-alt, uh, or control-copy, control... -copy, control um, Oh, stuff like that. It was doing that, but as I you hit the key, enough. it would go dark. Yeah. Huh. Well, that still could be the cable because what is happening when you're hitting the key, you're pressing down on it. And it could be that that's mm -hmm. just right where the cable's attached or flexing a part of the motherboard where the cable's attached. I mean, it's hard, you know, obviously I'm sitting here, you're sitting there. It's hard for me to say through the radio what's wrong with it, but that sure right. sounds like it. Okay. So you think it's the cable? Yep. Okay. Is it under warranty still? No, no. No, I've had it a few years. They're pretty good. You know, I, uh, you know, call them and see what they'll do. They might, they might uh, say, yeah, send it to us. We'll fix it. Okay. They probably won't do it for free, though. Sorry. <laughs> Understandable. It shouldn't be too expensive. That's and and if you feel ambitious, go online, and and Google. Uh, I'm sure there's a YouTube video of somebody replacing the ribbon cable on their on their Dell two in one. I guarantee you, uh, there's there's a video for everything on YouTube. Yeah, yeah and just see and look at it and see how hard it was. You know, is it five screws in the bottom? You take that off, you could probably get a replacement ribbon cable online. Uh, you know, uh, Burke, my uh, repair guy. I, we have a great guy. Uh, we hired Burke. We met many years ago. When one of our mixers went down, he was fixing uh, fixing those mixers, and Colleen, my engineer, said, we should hire this guy. He's good, and we've had him ever since, and he <laughs> fixes everything. He's the guy who wears the little magnifying goggles and has the little you know, soldering iron, the little pencils, and the little screwdrivers yeah. and stuff. He says, ifixit.com almost certainly has a video on how you can fix it, and they'll even sell you the part and tools you need. Oh, cool. Okay? Okay. Great. Take care. Thanks for the call. I appreciate it. I hope that's what it is. I mean, it, you know, the only reason I say try the drivers first is because that's easy. And if it is that, then, you, you know, you've saved yourself some money. 8888 Ask Leo. com. <clears throat> we'll put a link to iFixit uh, there. That's the website. Um, it's free. No sign up. Everything's there. Putting it all online so you don't have to write it down while you're driving, that kind of thing. Michael, Detroit, Michigan. Hello, Michael. Hey, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. I'm buying a printer, all-in-one printer, scanner, copier for the first time in like 10 years. And this has actually been a fairly complicated purchase. I'm hoping you can kind of guide me in the right direction. Sure. I'm not going to be doing that much printing. Um, but when I do print, obviously, I want to have a nice, nice quality printer. Um, the main thing I'm doing is I'm helping my family uh, downsize. We're going to be... Um,
scanning a lot of really old and some uh, very small photographs, family photographs Ooh. that we want to preserve. Yeah. Digitally. Yeah. Right. So I've been I've been researching this and I um, I did my homework before calling you, but I, I know I'm probably going to need a completely separate um, scanner or maybe even like a dedicated service for things like uh, neg- 35 millimeter negatives and slides. I'm not going to try to um, scan those on just because I understand the limitations of these all in one printers. But for at least for photos that are a decent size, maybe, you know, three at least three by fives or something like that. Um, here's what's been confusing me. There's too many for every brand out there. There's, <laughs> there are too many models. I, I know they, you know, understand. and it's, how do you know what's right? Yeah. I understand. And then you call these companies and they don't even, the person answering the phone doesn't even <laughs> really know the difference. They've got to put you on hold every question you ask for five minutes to research it. And then I'm not even sure I'm getting good answers so, from them. But number the one, Amazon reviews yeah. are always your friend. And remember that the reviews, some of them are written by competitors, some of them are written by the company, but I read the reviews. Right. And honestly, that's, re in, you know, always look for a verified reviewer. Those are real people saying what their experience is. So you, that's a really good resource. There are also good review sites. Uh, PC Magazine still reviews printers and scanners. Uh, the Wire Cutter, which is a New York Times website, is very good. I always refer people to that. Let me tell you a little bit what I know about this subject. Uh, you're absolutely right about the negatives and slides. That's a, a completely different kind of scanner because normal scanners, whether it's a multifunction printer or a standalone scanner, you're putting a piece of paper in there, it's bouncing light on that paper, and then a camera on an arm is moving down the page reading right. the the light the lit up page well if you do that with a negative you're going to get nothing the negative has right. to be lit exactly. from behind you have to shine a light through exactly. the negative or slide and most scanners don't do that unless you buy one that's specifically for negatives or slide scanners our sponsor epson does make a standalone scanner a number of them the uh, i think it's the perfection series that have slide scanning so they have a light in this ca and a camera on the top and a light and a camera on the bottom and mm -hmm. the problem with doing it that way is you get a little holder. You can do maybe a few slides at a time. Um, <clears throat> it, my, when I had to scan, uh, my mom has probably 20 Kodak carousels filled with slides. When I had to scan those, I took it to a service. They clean it. They scan it. They give you a DVD. It's a much better way to do it. Stills is another matter. Epson does make, it's our sponsor. You probably heard me mention it, a scanner for sl for uh, prints called Fast Photo. It also scans documents. It's a little pricey, but it is it has a great sheet feeder, so it's a really good way to scan both sides of a photo. That's a great choice, not an all-in-one. I wouldn't use a multifunction for anything but light scanning. Hang on. i got to talk... I do an ad here, but I'll talk more in a bit. <clears throat> the fast photo, if you had a lot, like if you had shoebox after shoebox after shoebox, uh, is 600 bucks, so it's expensive. But if you have enough to print, enough to scan, rather, it will it pays for itself because it's, you'll spend more than 600 bucks scanning, you know, thousands of photos. And that way, right. then you have a scanner. It's a very good standalone scanner. Uh, I uh, Epson also makes all-in-one, you know, multifunction printer scanners. Those are fine for, you know, they're they're flatbed scanners, so they're fine for if you got a piece of paper putting it on there. Not so great for photos because it's one F at a time, but it takes forever. Right. Let me ask you about DPI because <clears throat> yeah. the real question: I, Do you happen to know the DPI on that? Um, that six hundred dollar Epson scanner that you mentioned. Uh, it's high enough. What's Let's, the max. Uh, I don't know. Let me see. There's okay. so you want to balance. I'm looking it up. You want to balance the DPI with storage. And remember, if you're scanning stills, uh, the DPI you could have. If you do twelve hundred DPI, that's going to probably be more than the resolution of the still. They'll go up to twelve hundred right, DPI. I wouldn't right, go more than twelve hundred. Huh? You think twelve hundred is more oh god more yes, than I'll ever need. and mo most of the time you don't even want. You'll probably want to do half that at best. But if the, if the, <clears> if the photo is really small, that I think that's yeah what you need. maybe yes. Well, that's when you do twelve hundred because then you can enlarge it. Yeah, but remember yeah, when you enlarge you it, would, you're going to see yeah. the the <laughs> If you took a magnifying glass and looked at that photo, you could see there's not that much detail really. 
Right. So blowing it up okay, I mean, isn't going to make it. It's going to look. Go ahead. Sorry. Go. I, I was just going to say, obviously, you know, we can only scan as good as the photograph exactly. will allow us to. Exactly. I want to be able to capture the maximum quality. I want to do this once and do it right and yep. not have to do it again. I would say so, in general. So if you look at a, a laser printer page, that's 300 DPI. You can't see any dots. Uh, if you look on your smartphone, uh, always less than 500 DPI. I don't. Uh, maybe some are a little more than 500 DPI. So any image that you look at on your smartphone, can you see dots? Can you? It, the resolution's fine. 1200 is a lot, and when you okay. do have 1200, you're going to get massive file sizes, and it's going to be slower to scan. So right. you could right. do some test scans. It'll go up to 1200. Well, most scanners will these days. Um, there are some that go up to 4,800. That's I nuts. 2,430. That's nuts? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good to hear. <laughs> that's just right. nuts. 1,200 is more than you think I would even, even for a small photo, it's yes. more than more than. Yes. Position. Yeah. Okay. And then um, do you happen to know any of the Epson? I, I'm looking at an Epson right now, and the one I'm looking at is called the Workforce 3720. Would you yeah. happen to know anything about that model? I have a Workforce... What I don't like about those workforces is they're not using the tanks; they're using cartridges. So I would look. I know, but I don't. I don't need to print that much. So it's okay. It, no, the workforces are good. I had a, a 44, 4550, I think. Um, I like the workforce a lot. That's a great all-in-one multifunction. It even has scanning. Uh, I mean, uh, faxing. I think they're very good. Yeah, and if for light print duty, I think they're great. Uh, I would look at the tank just because it's the ink is like light years cheaper well like i said i think the, the eco tank makes sense when i'm going to be doing a lot of printing on an ongoing basis yeah, yeah, i might yeah, be yeah. printing literally one one or two or five pages like a month oh okay yeah you might even look at a laser you might now epson doesn't make lasers but you might look at a laser printer for light duty like that the problem with any inkjet printer is they tend to get clogged if you hardly use them what about printing, if I make myself print a test page like once a week? Would that? Would yeah, that it's a good idea. Things? Yeah. Is that? Would you think that would be sufficient to yeah. keep the ink from drying up? Absolutely. Okay, so I'll just Sunday will be my day. I print something no matter yeah. what. Yeah, print, print something recycle. no matter what. Thank you for let me be myself. Always a pleasure to be myself with you. I don't have to put on airs. I'm just me, and that's because you are just you, and you're great. Thank you for being here. Uh, Leo Laporte, your tech guy, taking your calls. We talked a lot about printers and scanners. Of course, I have to give a plug to our sponsor, Epson. They do great, great stuff, both printers and scanners. In fact, I've been using Epson since I started computing back, <laughs> back with you know an Apple II and an Epson MX80. They've been around for a long, long time. And I realized how good Epson printers were when I did a photo. Uh, it wasn't a workshop exactly. It was for uh, my friend Michael Olin was writing a book about Lightroom, and he took a dozen of the best photographers in the world, National Geographic, et cetera, photographers, to Tasmania in Australia for two weeks. We had so much fun. I was the mascot. I'm not a good photographer. I was just a mascot. But at the end, we used these beautiful Epson printers to print out big prints of this, which we sold uh, at auction to benefit the Tasmanian devil, because they were having some uh, health problems. By the way, good news. I think they've solved those problems. And so we we raised a lot of money, and we printed out these big, I mean, I don't, you know, one foot by two foot giant prints with these Epson printers, and they are gorgeous, archival inks and everything. That's when I got convinced uh, that that's the best way uh, to print. And frankly, there's scanners I've used for years, too. So I know they're a sponsor. Disclaimer, they're a sponsor, but... They're, you know, I'm pretty picky about my sponsors. I guess that's, I guess that's the answer on that one. John and Utica, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, John. Hello. Hi, good evening. Uh, how are you? I'm well. Um, I, I got a question. This is a problem I created myself, but I have a uh, Euler Packard uh, G62 laptop computer I bought in 2010. Yeah. And um, it has a Windows 10 on it now. I upgraded from the... Good the, man. Yeah. And um, but I don't really use the Windows that much. I use a USB live Linux. Uh, Good, uh, even system. better, John. You're you're a man after my own heart. But but I got into this bad habit of like whenever the computer froze, rather than push the on and the off button, I would 
unplug the, the battery <laughs> died a, a long time ago, so I have it hooked that's up. That's a very bad habit. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and generally speaking, it, it hasn't bitten me. But then about maybe three months ago, um, it, when I when I went to start it up again, a blue screen came up, and I think it was checking the BIOS, but I never saw the screen before, and it scared the heck out of me, so I, um, I pulled the plug again. Oh, and, yes. and now when I put it in, nothing, literally nothing happens. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, well, it is a 10-year-old computer. Yeah, well, you know, in computer years, that's 140 years old. Okay. It's barely can, you know, stand up. But it was working until I screwed it up. Yeah, so you screwed it up. That is a very bad habit. Here's Let me tell you why it's a bad habit. When you unplug a computer, most of the time, it's not doing anything because computers spend a lot of time waiting around for humans. But if it happens to be writing to the disk or writing to, you know, firmware or something, when you unplug it, uh, it, it the results are as computer gurus would put it, unknown. <laughs> you know, well, it could just it could completely trash the thing. Well, and you so know, you've I, been I, lucky. I learned my lesson. <laughs> you've been lucky. I don't know what that blue screen was, but if it were, were for instance, and this could really be what's going was going on, it was updating firmware at the time, and you unplugged it, uh, you would have now a brick, a very nice, handsome laptop that you could use to hold your door open. But not much else. Once, Is there anything I could do as far as like taking the back off and doing anything, or you know? Well, maybe. I, it depends what. I don't know what went wrong. So yeah. when you turn it on, what happens? Literally nothing. The, you know, the power light used to come on. You don't even hear a fan or anything. Well, that's just the thing. You know, I have one of those um, you know additional coolers for the bottom, and it's plugged in through a USB a USB uh, port on the uh, laptop. Yeah. That, that comes on, so the good power's going through. It ain't the power supply. That's that's good. Yeah, I eliminated that. Yeah, I actually. But you may uh, have fried the motherboard. Okay. <laughs> if nothing's happening and you're not getting beeping or anything, you hear nothing. Yeah, you may have you. I think you fried the motherboard. Okay, there's no, there's no like, I, I mean, not that I'm, I don't know what the heck I'm talking about, but I, I read something about like a CMOS battery and things like that. Is that anything even yeah, like that? Yeah, I mean, it could be. If the CMOS battery goes, and it does wear out, it certainly would be worn out by now, it wouldn't mean the computer couldn't boot. It just would mean it would, it would wake up confused. Okay. Like Rip Fram Winkle after a 20-year nap. It would go, I don't know what's going on. What's the hard drive? What's going on? I don't know. And you can fix that. You know, we put another battery in. The, what happens is it doesn't remember its settings, that's all. But it would okay. still turn on. Yeah, it would still go into BIOS. I think you, and now that you, I know that your USB ports are getting power, I don't think it's your power supply. So that, by a process of elimination, you fried something. Yeah. Uh, probably on the logic board. It's a 10-year-old computer. If it were one-year-old, I'd say bring it to HP. They might be able to fix it. 10-year-old computer, nobody even wants to look at it. Let me just see what a G62 on eBay, they do have quite a few G62s available for around 40 bucks. Okay. <laughs> so, if you wanted, you could just go on eBay and buy another one. It would work. But we're talking about, like, you know, with someone's used one or something like that. Yeah, well, here's one for $18. Yeah, I, I, I think I'd be... Like... You getting the picture? <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you something? Though? Wait, Wait a minute, here's one for 99 cents. Okay, you're rubbing it in now. <laughs> <laughs> but generally speaking, the information and the stuff I had on the, on the hard drive. Oh, yeah, the hard drive's probably okay. So okay. you can take that out of the computer, and I uh, I think that's what you're going to need to do. It's a little bit like brain surgery. But you can open up, usually... Well, I've already done that. I've oh, all right. And you pulled I it out? I swapped in a, one of those um, solid-state drives just to see if it was the drive that was the problem, and uh, it still wouldn't do anything. You so would, I'm... even if the drive weren't connected, you'd be able to get into BIOS. Okay, yeah. Something's gone wrong. Um, but yes, take that drive out. You can either get an external box for it. You'll, it's a laptop, so it's got to have an unusual connector on it. But they have external containers that'll do laptop drives. Oh, those, those X things, I have one of those, yeah. Yeah, just put it in there. Everything should still be on there. Uh, unless when you unplugged it, you fried the whole thing, but it's unlikely. It's much more likely that you just <laughs> yeah, I know, with a lot of pictures my wife took, and she's going to kill me if I did that. Don't tell her. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and uh, can I recommend me? our sponsor, iDrive? Back it up. Oh, you know, I copied that down yesterday when I was Good. listening to you. Yeah, a little and late. To the fast mail thing, I, 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 I get so much. You know, there was something that you said about Linux one time on the USB. Yeah. Where it was like some sort of like uh, some sort of uh, you had to go into like the settings and stuff, yeah. where you had sort of like that kind of like uh, uh, that that protection you have the DHS over something. 
It was, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. DNS over HTTPS, yeah. We started doing that after I heard you say Oh, man, you're, you're paying way too much attention to me. <laughs> not enough is enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably, John, once or twice heard me not say not to do that. That's all right. You know what? You I got, missed those shows. That computer lasted 10 years. Do your wife a favor. Go out and spend a couple hundred bucks. Get a nice new computer. It'll be fast. Yeah, she's, she's at Home Shopping Club all the time looking for one of those. Oh, don't get it out. No, don't. Do me a favor. Do not get it on Home Shopping Club. Oh, ooh, 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 oh, no, no, no. Because they, they always sell. The first, it's, they'll over, it'll be overpriced, underpowered. Oh, they always okay. sell last year's model or older. Go to a big box store if you really want to save. They have very good return policies. They won't be the latest state state of the art thing, but you'll save a little bit. Oh, that's so we're not like that kind of. You know what we did? We we needed a computer really quick after this one. Uh, you know, messed up on us. We I I, I went to Target. I got a Chromebook with this, like seventeen inch screen. Those are great. Sixty five bucks. And Those that's are great. Using. That's but fine. I, I prefer Linux. I prefer Linux though. You're using Linux. It's just a stripped down version of Linux. Yeah, yeah I know. I, but you know what it is? It's just so alien from like Linux Mint and other ones I've I used. I love it. Linux. I. I, I, I'm with you on that one. Yeah, it's a beauty. Um, you get used to it and you can't, you, you yeah. hate to leave it. Get yourself a little bit of uh, something with a little bit more oomph and Linux will run beautifully. I think you'd be very happy. There are even companies, uh, Dell, including Dell, that sell Linux first computers. Dell sells, they call it the developer edition. In fact, I'm waiting about two more weeks. Dell's going to release the new XPS 13 developer edition running Ubuntu. I'm going to buy that uh, the minute it comes out because it's a beautiful computer with great battery life. You know and, that was my first uh, my first Linux system was Ubuntu, and but uh, quite frankly, I, for some reason, like I was reading stuff about the, the direction they were going as compared to the other. If you like Mint, use Mint. You use what you like because that's yeah, the Mint is a, cho It's all about choice. BSD is where I really want to go, but I'm afraid. Oh man, you're a, you're a hardcore computer. <laughs> hey, I got to run. It's great to talk to you. Well, thank you very much. Take care, John. I hope you get your wife's pictures back. I do. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I had a great time. I hope you did too. We're going to do it all again next week. Remember the website, techguylabs.com. I'm Leo Laporte, your tech guy. I'll see you next time. Have a great Geek Week. Go Niners. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.